to preface. This happened around three years ago, and then one year ago. I was 16 at the time, and religious. I'm currently hitting 20, and I'm still semi-religious, and still completely unsure of what the hell happened. Anyway, every year, the church I attended held camps over the summer and winter months. One for children, and one for high school aged kids, of which I fell into the latter category. The camp is held in Arrow Bear Mountain area of Southern California, close to Big Bear, so we're really not that far from the nearest city. The first few days and nights are completely uneventful. We had a great time being kids and hanging out with friends in the mountains. But the last two days is where things got intense. The first event happened when the camp counsellor of our group, who was in a particular grade in high school, and I was going into junior year as I graduated early, says that we should all go out for a Bible study at night. So it sounds like fun. We gear up for a small hike, and set out at around 10pm. We go for a while, and as we near the spot where we were all to settle down, we hear some noises consistent with medium sized branches falling into the forest. Now, branches fall all the time, but they seemed really frequent. I didn't really pay any attention to it, but after what happened next, it might be relevant. We sit down on a large rock, my back towards the forest. The group was about 15 kids and one adult counsellor. About three quarters of the way into the study, my friend and I hear noises from behind us. Large, cracking noises. It sounded like someone or something was throwing big rocks into trees. Weird, but maybe it's just one of the group. Then the noises grew louder, and everyone heard it. And then nothing. The group finishes its study and begins to pray. I hear a soft rustling noise behind me once more, but nothing too strange for the woods, until the hairs on the back of my neck stand up straight. This intense feeling of dread and fear came over me. I couldn't move, and I wanted to scream, but I didn't know why. Finally, I managed to turn around very slowly, and what I saw changed me forever. There I saw a creature. At first, all I saw were two red floating orbs, divided by uneven geometric shapes like an insect. And in those eyes, I saw pure and horrifying hatred. I knew that whatever this thing was, it wanted me dead. The creature was darker than the already pitch black woods behind me, but slowly its edges became more visible like a red film came over it, and I knew it wanted me to see it. It had the basic anatomy of a canine, but its head was deformed and disgusting. There were open sores, and clumps of fur missing. I couldn't move, except for to nudge my friend. He, far less religious than I, just screamed, what the hell, in the middle of group prayer. This creature laughed at us, and with one backwards movement was gone. But I knew he was close by. How? I don't know. Fast forward to departure day. My friend and I still have no idea about what it was, and the priest at camp didn't want to jump to any conclusions, since nobody but my friend and I actually saw it. He didn't know what to think. As we boarded the bus and sat down, I felt watched. I looked back in the general direction of the vent, and I know that it was letting me know it was there, like a goodbye kind of thing. And then, it was gone. Two years later, this being last year, I see it again. 
I have been going every year since, and was even a counsellor at this point. It was at the high school camp, where I was part of the staff at the same location. Again, the second to last day we're there, it happened. We were on the main grounds about a mile away from the first encounter. I'm sitting by the fireplace, talking to a cute staff member and just chilling. When I get the original feeling again, dread. She must have felt it too, because she bolted upright and started praying, partially in tongues. Basically, for those unfamiliar with the term, it's when one who is engaged in speaking for spiritual reasons begins speaking in an entirely, sometimes unintelligible language, often seen as a gift by some Christian denominations. I look into the dark forest down the hill, and there he is again, under a light post, and in my mind I hear, hate, hate, why can't you die? The creature was stomping his front paws and trembling with rage. At this point, I'm flipping out. I don't know what the hell is going on or why this is happening. And I begin to question my sanity. This can't be real, can it? The girl I was with grabs my arm and holds me close. The being I saw before howls a disgusting guttural noise and bolts up a hill, and I lose sight. I look at her and I ask her if she saw it too. She said, no. I just felt like I had to start praying, but I didn't see anything. She paused for a second and said that she heard a name, but she didn't really hear it. But it was like a sixth sense. Hatred and rage. Well, that makes sense. Fast forward one more to the last night and the girl and I have gotten close. We're friends, but we also have a bit of a spark between us. We're sitting at the soccer field holding hands and just relaxing after a physically exhausting day of sports and hiking. The camp is a great place, not just for kids. It's tons of fun, but I digress. The sun has long set and we're looking at the stars, googling constellations, and astronomical stuff on our phone. And then I start crying. At once, I felt depressed and hopeless, and I wanted to cry until I couldn't anymore. I forced myself to look around, and I saw a very disheartening sight. Hatred was back, and he brought a friend. This thing was even more horrid than the first one. It was physically larger than the first creature, but its head looked to be slapped on there, like the original head was ripped off and replaced with this one, akin to a bug, but even creepier, was at the point of the neck where it looked like it was ripped off. There were tentacles, not like octopus or anything, it's indescribable. There's nothing I can link them to. All I hear is, yes, over and over, and I knew it was the second creature. The girl I was with is dead still, and I know she sees it. She starts whispering a prayer. We need to go. Oh my God, we need to leave. And she says to me, his name is Sorrow and Despair. Hatred, the first creature, bolts off, while Sorrow just calmly walks away, taking his sweet time. As he left, I slowly regained my emotions and made a beeline to the pastor's cabin. At this point, he believes me, and thinks it was probably a demon. My friend who was with me in the first encounter has turned to drugs, and his whereabouts are unknown though he's definitely close to home. One of my friends will see him around, and he looks decently fed and clean. I don't really think it was because of this incident. And the girl mentioned, while we never dated, she still remains a good friend. 
She usually refuses to talk about it as it freaks her out. But remember it, she does. I don't know what happened, and you may not believe me. But I give you my word, this is true. All of it. Was it a ghost? A demon? I don't know. I didn't believe in either until now. I honestly have no clue. Part of me says I'm crazy, and the other part of me thinks I should just forget about it all. But I just needed to tell someone. I'm an 18 year old male, and I moved from my hometown in with my mum about a year ago now, into a farmhouse pretty much in the middle of nowhere, on the east side of Australia. It was at the very end of a seven kilometer long driveway that had two other houses on it, both with elderly couples in them, and a 30 minute drive away from the nearest town, which is very small, with only a thousand inhabitants. I'd feel really uncomfortable some nights when I was outside having a cigarette. The old feel like you're being watched feeling and occasionally would wake up to hear footsteps outside. And I'm sure they didn't sound like the sheep and rams that were near our place. I have a history of drug abuse, and I'm quite paranoid because of it. So I tried to rationalize it by telling myself I was being paranoid. One night, I awoke at 3am and needed to take a leak. When I looked out my bedroom window, and very briefly see a flash of light, like it had come off a torch on a phone. Seeing as though we live in the middle of nowhere, this freaked me out a lot. And I stayed up until morning listening and looking out but hearing nothing. Maybe a week later, my dad wants to cut the grass. He hops on the lawnmower to realize its tires are slashed, which he blamed on me. But I didn't care because it's just further enforcing the idea that there was someone lurking around in the property. My mum knew I wouldn't do anything like that, and instead thought the neighbour had done it. I always chatted with the neighbour when I went for walks, and I liked him, and really doubted he could have done it, let alone be able to walk that far as he was quite old, and if he came in a vehicle late at night, we all would have heard it. My stepdad ended up moving out, because he's a drinker, and I witnessed him on the verge of being violent with my mum, and intervened. So he moved out next day, and we haven't seen him since, thankfully. With him gone, and it only being me, my mum, and my three-year-old sister there, and considering we can't legally own a gun in Australia, and the cops taking a good hour to get here if we needed them, I got increasingly paranoid about the things that have been going on, because I felt I had to be protective. Some nights I would stay up very late, and before going to sleep would turn off all the lights and walk around silently, looking around the windows for any sign. And sure enough, on a few occasions, I would see torches way off in the distance in the middle of the cow paddocks, as if someone saw all the house lights turn off, and started to make their way over, at 3am. Which is weird to say the least, considering that in every direction, other than towards the other houses on our road, there was absolutely nothing but bush and paddocks for a good 20 kilometers. I should add that our front door didn't properly lock and should easily be opened by just messing with the handle a bit. So I started putting a wheelbarrow up against the door and a metal sheet behind the wheelbarrow. So if the door opened, it would make a very loud noise that would definitely wake me up. A few weeks went by, and I saw and heard absolutely nothing. So I began to get much less paranoid and was thinking about it a lot less. One night, I had gotten back from the pub and was still a bit drunk on my phone in the lounge room. All the lights were off because my mum and sister were asleep. And I was just laying there texting and listening to music. We have two cats. And on this night, they were frisky and running around wildly. So when I heard the metal sheet, I figured it was just the cats and ignored it. Then walked straight past it to my room maybe a half hour later, 
not giving it a second glance. The next morning, my paranoia immediately came back in full swing, and I proceeded to freak out when I saw that not only had the sheet fallen over, the door itself was ajar, and the wheelbarrow had been moved a good six inches as well. There's no way in hell one of my cats could have done that. The only explanation I have for this is that somebody tried to let themselves in, heard the bang, and ran off. A few nights after this, my mum woke me up late, maybe 4am, to ask me to come out to her car with her, because all of her car lights were on, and she didn't want to go out by herself. We went out, turned off all the lights, and brought the keys back, which we usually just leave in the car with us inside. The car battery was dead, and we had to get our neighbour to come down with jumper cables the next day. She certainly didn't want any of the lights on, and all of the doors were shut, meaning somebody went inside, pressed the button on the roof, put the keys in the ignition on the accessories, and exited and closed the door, with what we think was the intention of draining the battery. She began agreeing with me that somebody was lurking around the house, and told me a few things she had noticed that she didn't want to tell me because I was already anxious and didn't want to put me more on edge. Like when the tank water started tasting funny, and she found a half decomposing possum on the grate on top of the tank. She didn't mention how she couldn't possibly see how it could have ended up there, unless it happened to die right there on that exact spot and somehow didn't start making the water taste funny, until it was decomposed so you could see its bones, and how a garden rock was moved in a weird position right outside her window, as if someone was using it to stand on to look inside. The house closest to the road had multiple dogs, and the one that I was friendly with who lived closer, maybe three kilometers from us, had a gun and often shot rabbits and foxes, so that definitely made us the easiest target. All of this made both of us very concerned, and we ended up finding a house and moving about a month later. I know this is anticlimactic, but it still freaks me the hell out, and I can't think of any other explanation than someone lurking around our house for multiple months. There were many times when no one was home all day, and if they wanted to steal from us, they could have easily have come in and taken all our stuff, but nothing was ever missing. Might just be overthinking it, but I truly think they had some very sinister intentions, and were intentionally messing with us. Ever since I was young, I loved working in the outdoors. It was my favourite thing to do. So when I signed up to be a park ranger, it was the perfect fit. I've had a number of strange things happen to me on the job, most of which aren't even worth mentioning, just small things like apparitions or feeling someone behind my back, turning around and no one there. But there's one experience that I don't think will ever leave my mind. This happened in the little ranger cabin, where I used to spend a fair bit of my time writing reports and doing this, that and the other, when I wasn't out walking and protecting the trails. I was there one evening, just as it was getting dark, and I heard a noise on the radio. I assume it's my partner who's out checking, and when I listen, the sound is all static and muffled. I ask if everything's alright, and wait for a response. After a few minutes, I start getting worried. Is he okay? I know there's no cell service here, but I try him anyway. He didn't get my message, and he didn't answer my call, not that it went through. So I try the radio one more time, but it's dead. About 45 minutes pass at this point with no news, and my partner should have been back by now. But I give it another half hour just in case. I don't want to be overreactive. And when he hadn't come back, it was well and truly dark. I start getting scared. So I go out to explore. The area we have to cover, by all means, isn't that large. We have a few routes that we have to check on, and I go and investigate the one that he was scheduled to do. I take my vehicle, and away I go. 
I'm strolling through the trails looking around and I can't see any sign of him. Just as I'm about to get to halfway point, passing a river, do I hear something? It's the buzzing of my radio. It almost sounds like static. I push the button and listen. There he is on the other line. It's sort of like he's far away or underwater. It's hard to describe it. Hello, is everything all right? There's nothing. It's gone dead again. This is really giving me chills. And after five more minutes of driving, do I see his vehicle on the other side of the road? I stop, jump out, turn on my flashlight and have a look around. I see a trail not too far that I'm quite confident he's walked down. It's one that I personally have never explored and it's giving me the creeps. This is one of the few times that I've started to feel uncomfortable in the woods. The dread, not knowing if an animal has got to him or perhaps a person with a dark motive. I approach with trepidation, looking around, checking my surroundings and listening for noises as I get closer to where I hope my buddy's at. Just as I'm about to enter a little clearing, do I see his radio on the floor? I give a little, what the? And when I go to pick it up, I hear someone behind me. <sighs> I turn around, but no one's there. I stumble back in fear, fall flat on my butt and turn around in a panic. I look around, moonlight coming through the clearing. I don't see anyone and I book it back to my vehicle. I trip halfway through and land with my hand facing down on my radio and shatter it to pieces. I leave the bits discarded and run for my life. I feel a dark presence behind me as I run back to my vehicle. I sit there in what I feel like is a protected space, just hoping that this is safe enough as I don't think I have the willpower to move just yet. After a few minutes, I've calmed down enough and ask myself if I had just imagined that or it really happened. I try and throw water over my face, blink a few times and tell myself it must all be in my head. I'd recovered my friend's radio, which had his name written on the side in Sharpie, but mine was still scattered all over there. Littering is of course a big no-no where we work, so I know that I'm gonna have to come back and get it. Should I go now? Or should I do it later, I wonder? I'm so scared that I think perhaps it would be best to do it later. But my body's vehicle is still right in front. Torn, confused and scared, I tell myself that I'll just wait a little bit and see if he gets back. 40 minutes pass and he doesn't. So with his radio next to me, do I start making my way back to the clearing to look around? I get there, see the shattered pieces and the feeling of ominous darkness is gone. I gather them up in a little baggie that I conveniently had with me and make my way around the clearing shouting his name. Paul? No reply. After about 20 minutes, I'm starting to get anxious. Maybe I should call for help. And that's when I see him. He's on the floor, face down in the dirt, not too far from the tree line. I run over to him. I'm so glad he was wearing the little reflectors on his jacket as my light caught them just as I was about to leave. I ask him what he's doing face down in the dirt. And after giving him a few hearty pokes, does he finally make a noise and return to consciousness? He told me that he thought he heard someone like laughter, children's laughter. So he stopped and went into the clearing to investigate. But when he got to the middle, he passed out and he remembers nothing else. Confused and severely weirded out, we shine our flashlights in every direction as we make our way back to our vehicles and get the hell out of there. That was one of the strangest experiences we ever had on the job. Thankfully, nothing else weird ever happened, not in the last few years I worked there. But it's always left me wondering, what the hell did I hear? And was it even real? or all in my head. Every year for summer holidays, me and my family go to my grandparents' house 
in a region in France called Bretagne, and they have the luck to live on a cliff right next to the beach, which is pretty neat. And for you to understand the situation I was in, I'll do a quick description of the place, and most importantly, how to access the beach. When we get out of the house, we need to cross a little road to get to an entrance between bushes. Then it's a clear but narrow path that you can take to just enjoy the view of the sea, or you can also go to a staircase built in the rock of the cliff. Then you'll just have to walk on medium sized stones, and ta da, you've arrived to the beach. The place itself is pretty big, but there's only a few ways to access it by the staircase I described, or by another one at the other end of it. Also, the big thing to mention as I grew older, I stopped building sandcastles and swimming with my family. I'm 18, and the older of three siblings that are way younger than me. So I was done playing childish games. And I had started to climb on the cliffs for fun. Not the steep ones, it was more or less the semi hiking of partially collapsed cliffs. This will be relevant later. Last year, after having dinner, I headed out for a little walk on the beach. No one seemed interested in coming with me. So I went alone. No big deal. I did it every evening. After going down the staircase, I walk a little bit, and then sat down on a stone to smoke a joint and listen to some music. Not really smart, but hey, I'm a teen in a little village that I go to every summer. And as much as I love my family, it gets pretty boring from time to time. I'm enjoying my me time, when I spot a guy from the corner of my eye, about 40 meters away from me. No big deal. It's a free access beach after all. But then he starts heading towards me. His head was shaved, and he had square shaped glasses on, maybe around mid 20s to early 30s. He was pretty tan, like he worked outside, and the bald dude continued getting closer. I mean, I can't say anything, I don't own the beach. As he's approaching me, I hear over my music that he's trying to speak to me. I remove my headphones, and he said something along the lines of, Hey, you look familiar. Have we met before? Um, no. He kept insisting that he saw me at the beach today. And sure, I said, Yeah, well, maybe, but there are tons of people at the beach. I don't remember seeing everyone I saw. The way I responded clearly implies that I'm not interested in having this conversation with him. But he sits right next to me, and he keeps talking, mostly about himself, and that he loves the beach, that the weather is nice, and that I'm nice with him. Here's when things got creepy. He says that it's rare to find nice girls, and that he's happy I'm not like the other girls. He then asks me about my name, where I live, and of course I don't say anything. He starts to lean in closer, which made me feel very uncomfortable, with a huge grin on his face. That's when it hit me. Remember when I said that there was only a few entrances to the beach? That guy was sitting right between me and the staircase. I was cornered, no one was there, and we were completely alone. And even though I'm quite athletic, I'm four foot nine and weigh 90 pounds, this guy is twice my size, and he clearly wants to continue our discussion. As I'm not responding, he starts to sound annoyed clenching his fists, but still with that stupid grin glued to his face. He asked me if I really was a good girl, and why don't I talk to him? I'm bricking it at this point. I look to my left, and almost let out a sigh of relief. One of the cliffs I'm used to climbing is right next to us, and I know I could rush up in a matter of seconds, and I used to do it running run on a narrow path and get straight home. So I got up and said, I don't want to talk to you anymore. Good evening. He looked startled for a moment looking back to me in the staircase, which confirmed my suspicions. He thought he had blocked my only way of escape 
since the other stairs were far away. To this day, it still scares me that it was his first reaction. At this point, I'm high, tired, and terrified, but I start to walk confidently to the cliff at my high pace, and in the corner of my eye, I can see that he is standing, looking in my direction. As soon as I'm close enough, I literally start to jump from rock to rock as fast as I can, scratching myself in the process. When I scramble to the top, I look down and he's looking at me, not smiling like before, but frowning, a look which tells me he's on the verge of committing a crime. I then sprinted to my grandparents' house, which Lucky is really close, and explained everything to my mother the next day. I reported the guy to the police station, giving the best description that I could, since it is a small village, and they could apprehend him easily if he was a resident. So yeah, I made it out. What did this guy actually have planned? I'm glad I didn't have to stick around to discover what it was. I was with a group, staying about two to three days in Lake Havasu, a Native American reservation just adjacent to the Grand Canyon. For those who aren't familiar, this place is pretty funky and strange and a pretty hot tourist destination. A few years ago, a female Japanese tourist was found murdered somewhere on the reservation. And I think it turned out to be a local who had killed her. Anyway, my story isn't as horrific as that. You hike about eight miles from the top of the canyon, down switchbacks, and onto a dirt trail right down the center of a bone dry gorge. Some people ride horses into the reservations. There's literally no sign of civilization anywhere until you round a corner and there's clearly a relatively large town with houses and some minimal electricity, a police station and even a convenience store. Emaciated horses could be seen in many of the backyards. And you got that uneasy feeling every time the locals looked at you. The people seem pretty aloof though. Just on the other side of the town further down the gorge, you get to the top of Havasu Falls, which is where the campground starts and where the tourists stay. A much more familiar scene for campers than the town in the middle of the gorge with no paved roads. The falls are beautiful, with water stained blue from natural limestone and minerals in the nearby rock. The blue water runs through all the campsites, and people play in it under the falls. My group settled in for the evening. We were young kids with two adult chaperones. We were pretty naive, and thinking back, I imagine the chaperones were probably severely traumatized, being responsible for the well-being of the group. We fixed dinner, and sat around eating some backcountry brownies, and chatting, enjoying the scenery. Eventually it got dark, and we started telling ghost stories about scary things, like people who vaunt to wash your windows, because it sounded like Dracula or something. I don't know, I was a kid. One of the girls then started telling her story. She had the flashlight eerily lighting her face from below. We're all sitting in the dark around her. She hadn't been talking for more than a few minutes when a boy in the circle turned his light on abruptly and said, someone's there. He shined his light on an empty space besides the storyteller. And sure enough, there was a man, probably in his twenties to thirties, with long white hair, sitting cross-legged. No one heard him show up, and he sat there in silence. The girl recoiled, and the chaperones clearly felt caught off guard. But the older woman looking after us spoke up and said, Excuse me, sir. What are you doing here? The man hesitated a while. I'm just listening to ghost stories. She replied, well, this is our campsite, and we were hoping to have some privacy to spend time together. So, you want me to leave? Yes, please. Thank you. 
The man slowly stands up. He's big, really tall. He has a headlamp that he doesn't turn on, and he literally walks into the brush in vegetation. We listen as he crashes through it. So now everyone is thoroughly freaked out, and the chaperones are discussing the next actions for the group, and we decide to stay on high alert and chill there for a minute longer to see if he would really leave us alone. Maybe it was just a misunderstanding. So we're sitting there, and we start hearing this thunderous crashing throughout the brush, all around us in the pitch black. A few kids with lights start shining them into the darkness, and periodically, this man will be standing motionless on the edge of some bushes, before turning around and plunging into darkness again. He doesn't look angry, but he doesn't look friendly. At some point, he starts making this whooping sound, and that's when we decide it's time to get help. Conveniently, our chaperones actually had friends at another campsite where we retreated to for the evening. In the morning, we go back to our site. Everything is much less scary in the daylight, and our tormentor is sitting on the bench at the campsite just down the river from us. He's got a camelback on, and he appears mostly to be looking down. Occasionally, he looks up as we toast bagels and pans and boil water for oatmeal. We are instructed to ignore him as best we can. After all, we have a fun day under the falls to look forward to. As we get our swimming gear set up, we stand up, and so does the man. Our female chaperone was the only one left at this point, because someone had gotten bit by something in the rush to get to the next campsite the prior night. As we walk, our chaperone tells us to walk faster and faster, to where we're almost running. As we come up to some other campsites with more people, she decides that this is the moment for confrontation. She turns around a whole 180 degrees and is face to face with this guy, and she just lays into him, shouting at him about how he's watching kids, what the hell he's trying to do, and what's wrong with him, and for him to stay the hell away from us. This man is still staring down, clearly kind of shocked, but now other people are getting involved, and he's not being violent with her. She tells us to head up to the waterfalls and wait for her. She was only about 10 to 15 minutes behind us. The man showed up 45 minutes later, frolicking in the water with a big old smile on his face, on his camelback. He looked like a kid in a weird way. I almost didn't recognize him. He paid us no attention. When we asked our leader what had happened, she said they took the man, who we now know as Lee, back to his campsite where his dad was. Apparently, they were on some father-son trip, but he knew that something weird had happened to his son at Lake Havasu, with his old girlfriend. For some reason, Lee confused our chaperone with his ex-girlfriend, and thought she was doing God only knows what, but clearly, something he disapproved of. There was more to this story about the girlfriend running off with Lee's best friend. Mostly, it seemed clear to the rest of us that Lee had some mental health issues that needed to be addressed. I am a park ranger. There have been a few occasions where I have actually taken the night shift. Most of the time, I wrongfully pass out in the provided bed and wait until my shift ends. This story actually takes place during one of those occasions. I was fast asleep in the bed, even though the mattress was hard and didn't adjust to my back. I had done my sight check and stared at the woods for about a half hour, but time moves on and my attention wavers so I came up with sleeping as one of my solutions to boredom. In an instant, I realized I was awake, 
and I immediately sat up in the bed. Something had woken me up. It was one of those occasions where something loud happens, but don't process it in time to register what it was. Whatever it was, it must have been loud. Glancing towards my alarm clock, I could see that it was 3.21am. I rubbed my eyes of what little sleepiness was still in me, and looked around to see if maybe something had fallen. Everything seemed to be in place. But these lights were off. And my nocturnal vision is less than supreme. I heard something shut. A tower door. The door was wide open flapping in the wind. That must have been it. I left the door open a little and a strong gust of wind must have thrown it open and against the wall. I guess it wasn't anything closing after all. The gust of wind was now just going through the room and disturbing my warm temperature. I rolled off my sheets, hopped out of bed towards the door, and I pushed it with some force towards the wall, hoping to recreate the sound and trigger a memory. But the door didn't even fully reach all the way back to the wall. It's hinge keeping it firm. I shut the door fully this time and went back to my stone hard sleeping spot. I was able to fall back into a doze fairly quickly, before I was awoken again by what I assumed to be the exact same thing. I still didn't hear it. I looked towards the door and saw that it still remained shut, undisturbed since I last saw it. The alarm clock read 3.39. I had only been asleep for 18 minutes. I grew annoyed at the thought of not being able to fall asleep, and got up to search the kitchen. Being the same kitchen as every other tower, I could easily locate and check off each item I found as not being the culprit. All knives were still in their holder, the microwave was off, blender unplugged, the toaster didn't seem to be the cause, so that meant it probably wasn't an electric thing making the noise. The floor was clean and the cabinets were shut. I was truly clueless, gave up my search and went to sleep, sat under the covers, still awake, and now in day mode because of all my detective work. Then I heard it. It was a scream. A scream that sounded like a car tire stuck screeching on asphalt. I was only able to identify it as a vocal product because of the changes in pitch going up and down in its high tone. It sounded inhuman, blood curdling and agonizing. I jumped out of bed, tripping on my covers and looked around. By now the screaming had stopped, but it was so loud that I knew it had to be coming from inside. I looked back to the kitchen. Whatever it was must be there. I looked from the appliances on the counter to the drawers and utensils that were laid out, to the two giant cabinets that were at the other end of the kitchen. The office joker Donnie was on vacation in Hawaii. I had seen him post about it earlier that day. There was no one else that worked here, which meant it wasn't a prank. I grabbed one of the sharp objects that sat in the holder and crept my way to the cabinet. I reached one arm into the silver handle the other poised with the weapon ready to defend myself. I threw open the door and readied myself for an attack, an attack that didn't come. I saw nothing in the cabinets beside a broom and other supplies that were above my pay grade. At first at least, until I glanced downwards to the raccoon that was crouched in the corner. It screamed that monstrous scream and I tripped backwards as it ran over me to safety under my rock of a bed. Even it knew that mattress was unbreakable. I opened the door again and poked at the raccoon with the broom until it finally ran back outside. So maybe I did hear a door shut after all. Poor thing must have been shut in there by the wind. It didn't matter, the noise was gone and I was finally able to go back to sleep. I curled under my blankets and rested my head on the pillow in serene peace, completely unaware of the horrific banshee that lied just above me on the ceiling.
I used to ride a motorcycle as a sole method of transportation when I was studying, and I used to work on hotel cocktail bars during the summer holidays. Six years ago, I was working at a historic, stereotypical grand hotel in a very rural area of the UK. I worked a long afternoon and evening into the night, finished cleaning up the bar around 2am and walked through the underbelly of the hotel to retrieve my motorcycle and make the journey home. I can still clearly remember the feeling of the crisp night air and the absolute pitch black silence of the countryside after the hot and seemingly never ending nights of serving drinks to dinner goers and party goers. It was always sort of intensely relaxing. Now that being an adult meant not being scared of the dark, or being outside on a motorcycle in the middle of nearly nowhere at 2am. Riding through the local towns took me a few minutes before I left to follow a dark country road home. At this point I rode a Honda 125cc, around 11 horsepower. Basic and old, but clean, it did the job regardless of its quirks, such as the dim headlights, which would dim and flicker even more when coming to a stop. I was riding along these pitch black roads with fields and woods surrounding me, very much alone for 20 minutes. Then I saw a brief blast of blue light headlights in my mirrors coming from behind. Moments later, dazzling headlights arrived behind me in seconds. Almost immediately, a large Range Rover pulls out to overtake me, blasting past barely inches away from me, and I respond with a long blast on my horn. The Range Rover pulls in front of me and slams on the anchor, in what seems like an attempt to have me lose control under my sudden braking or rear end the range. Bikes can, even when they're old and rely on dumb brakes, stop pretty quickly. So I didn't rear end the maniac in front. I came to a controlled stop. I see the door of the range crack open and a figure began to step out. I went for it, using all 11 horsepower of the little Honda's power, pulling an overtake. However, in those moments, this anger crazed maniac had shut his door and stepped on the accelerator causing us to be level and accelerating together when I reached his car. He then started to run me off the road, pulling to the right, wedging me further over towards the ditch at the side of the road. And this is where I ended up struggling to control the bike on the wet, dew, heavy grass around the side of the road, trying to stop the 140 kilogram motorcycle dropping into the ditch. I struggled to regain balance, but managed to pull the bike back onto the road. At this point, I noticed the guy had gotten back out of the Range Rover and walked around the back, opened it and was reaching inside. I had turned the bike to face the other side of the road, ready to turn either way and make an escape from the escalating situation. Just as I looked to turn, I took one more look over at him and see him pulling a large object out of the back of the range. I just went for it, taking another glance over my shoulder around 200 meters, to see he begun continued driving up the road away from where I'd ran off the road. I slowed down to see what he'd do next. After driving away from me, he reached the top of the road and pulled over to the left, waiting for me, the light reflecting on the road. It was eerie. My heart was beating so fast, yet it felt like time had stopped. I just carried on in the opposite direction to find an alternate home route in the pitch black. Just before doing this, I checked my phone for signal to see that I had no mobile coverage at all. Fantastic. Back in the day, I used to work as a park ranger. We covered an absolutely massive area, which I would like to keep private for the sake of anonymity. To give you a little bit of context, there was a very large cave in one of the areas which we protected. 
Sometimes if you would throw rocks into the cave, the echoing sound would almost be like a boom. It scared a whole lot of people who came across that area, or people who messed around and tried to play in there. We generally said that that place was unsafe, and put warnings up to let people know it wasn't worth risking your life going in there. Of course, one day we get a call saying that someone had seen someone else go into that cave. They'd waited, and they'd never saw them leave. It was starting to get dark, so they told us. Of course, we start making our way in twilight, already quite fearful of whoever's gone into that cave, as we're quite aware that things don't usually end well if you go in there. With our flashlight and ropes at hand, we start investigating and making our way down. The ropes were more of a precautionary measure. I suppose if you knew the cave system quite well, it wouldn't be that difficult to navigate, but it can be treacherous for those who have never stepped foot inside, especially the descent to access the cave itself, with sharp rocks and a few drastic drops where people are bound to get hurt. Just to cut to the future here, we actually had to scoop some guy out who'd fallen down and broken both his legs on the descent. It's quite a deep drop. Just goes to illustrate how foolish some people can be to access an area that's not supposed to be touched. In any case, back to the story. We started delving our way in to see if we could find this kid. We started calling out to him, letting him know that he wasn't in trouble and that we just wanted to help him out, that we had ropes and candy bars if he came with us. There was no reply. The further we went in, the hotter it seemed to be. And after we'd searched for about 40 minutes, seen and heard no one, were we starting to think that perhaps this was a hoax, or someone was just trying to waste our time. It was just around the time that we were searching the final few passages of this cave, that one of our partners called Jimmy screams out to come this way. We navigate our way over to where he is, and we find the boy huddled in a corner. We ask him why he's in there and if he's okay. We pick him up and start making our way out. This kid, blonde, blue eyes, and about four foot three, must have been absolutely petrified. He was caked in sweat in one of the deepest parts of the cave in the dark. I don't know why he never called out for help. After we'd scooped him up and started making our way out, we put him in the truck and asked him what was wrong as we made our way back to the ranger station. In these situations, it's best not to aggravate or upset someone who's done something wrong, especially a minor, as our job is to try and make them feel comfortable and get them back to safety. We tried our best to probe him the little bit we could, but he was very unresponsive. The person who'd called it in had actually found that kid's parents. They were worried sick. They were all waiting at the ranger station. The mother was so happy to see her son, and she thanked each of us personally. When she started scolding her boy, did I tell her that maybe that wouldn't be the best course of action, as he's in shock and quite upset. She, however, didn't want to hear it from me, and carried on scolding him, until he started wailing, nearly having a breakdown, in front of all eight of us at the ranger station. Only then did he start to speak about what actually happened. In tears, he said something along the lines of, Mummy, it's not my fault. The hairy man made me do it. I had to follow him into the cave. We stood there, mouths agape. What did he mean, the hairy man? I interjected. Son, is there someone in there? Was he trying to hurt you? He didn't respond to me. I want to go home, Mummy. The mother said that her son was tired, and that she wouldn't be having any more questions from us, but thanked us nonetheless, and was on her way. I suppose it wasn't our place. But the next day we went back, and did a bit more exploring to see if perhaps there was a homeless man who tried to lure the child in. There was nothing. It's still one of the biggest mysteries I've ever had to deal with in this job. What was he talking about? 
This area is known for Bigfoots, so I'm not discounting that. But why lead him into a cave and then vanish? What on earth could this be? This story happened a year ago, when I was 15 and on a school trip in San Fran. At the time, I was very immature. Not in the sense you'd normally think, but in the sense that I didn't really know how the world worked and how scary it could be. I attribute this story and a few other scary things that happened in the past year to me growing up and realizing how the world really works. I was roaming with two other girls in my room, both who were a year older than me, so I didn't really know them well. The way our trip worked, so to say, was the breakfast in the hotel was between seven and eight, but the chaperones on the trip wouldn't wake us up. So if we wanted to have time to get ready slash eat before we left to go explore the city for the day, we had to do it on our own. This meant that in the morning, me and the people in my room didn't see the chaperones till we all went down for breakfast usually around 745, since we all took a long time to get ready. However, this day was different. We were tired of arriving late and having to eat quickly. So we woke up a bit earlier to go down for breakfast right when it opened. We ate breakfast with pretty much the rest of the kids on my trip and all headed to the elevator together. This was a mixed boys slash girls trip and my twin brother also happened to be on the trip. So the people in the elevator were him and his friends, me and the girls from my room, and a few of their friends. The elevator door was almost closed when two Indian men stuck their hand through the door and stepped inside, squeezing themselves into an already packed elevator. They looked young, maybe 19 to 20. Eventually we arrived at our floor and all got off. So did the men. The way the hotel rooms and hallways were situated was essentially just a square. You could go anywhere around the floor and eventually make it back to the elevator if you turned left slash right three times. The people on my trip went right and the men went left. Eventually my brother and his friends trickled off into their rooms and it was just me and one of the girls on my trip, as the other one had went into one of the boys rooms. We were right at our room when we encountered the men again. At first, we didn't notice anything wrong. They were probably just trying to find their room. I turned away from them and tried to find my room key in my wallet. Now at this point, my immature brain didn't notice anything wrong. But my roommate did. I could see the panic in her eyes. And as I turned to look at the men, I realized they weren't looking for a room. They were looking for us. My heart began to race and we panicked, each fumbling for our own room cards to get into our rooms as quickly as possible. But they were moving towards us too quickly. We were standing there pressed against our door as these two men stepped closer to us and got within half a foot of our faces. Their English wasn't the best, so they slowly asked what we were doing. I couldn't speak. I didn't know what to do in this situation, so my roommate spoke up. She tried her best to not let them know that this was our room, but it was obvious at this point. She stuttered something about trying to get into her friend's room but these men clearly weren't there to know what we were doing. I could tell they were there for something far more sinister. One of the men continued to stare at me and eye me up and down while the other got really close to my roommate and asked for her number. She stood up taller and quickly said, no, I'm sorry, you can't. But her voice trailed off as her confidence wore off. At last I spoke explaining to them that we were underage and that we were on a school trip 
and that we couldn't. They didn't take no for an answer. At that point, I slowly started to pull my room key from my wallet. Luckily, my friend pushed the card back into my wallet and made me push my hand, holding my wallet behind my back. At that time, I was confused why she didn't let me in to go into our room. But now I realized she had more intuition about these men than I did. She knew that if we opened our room door with them right there, they'd likely force themselves in there with us, and who knows what would happen. Eventually, they backed off enough where we felt we could escape from them. She grabbed my wrist and pulled me along the hallway as we sprinted towards the elevator. Along the way, we ran into my brother and one of his friends. We quickly explained to them what happened, and they sprinted with us to the elevators. Once we were there, quickly pressing the elevator buttons to get downstairs to where our chaperones were, and we encountered the men again. I clutched onto my brother's arms, and my roommate did the same with my brother's friend's arm. They just stood on the other side of the hallway staring at us, and quickly walking towards us. It looked like they were pretending to be just normal hotel patrons in front of the boys, but we knew that they weren't just normal patrons. They were creepy, and we weren't risking it. Finally, the elevator door opened, and I didn't think I've ever pressed the closed door button so fast. Right as the men got there, the doors closed. We thought our ordeal was over, but it wasn't. There were multiple elevators in the hotel. My brother, his friend, my roommate and me had just gotten to the breakfast hall where most of our group slash chaperones were when we realized the men were there too. They had followed us. They started off staying across the room from us, but were getting closer. We left the room and went back up to our rooms. Once there, my roommate and I were panicking. They knew where our room was. They knew our floor. They could find us at any time, and we didn't know what they could do. Our panic was cut short when the phone rang in our room. At this hotel, you could call other people's rooms, and we thought it was one of the boys playing a joke. We were wrong. When we picked up the phone, it was just heavy breathing and quiet laughing. We hung up after about 20 seconds. I called my brother and his friends and asked them to meet us outside our room. They walked us to the elevators and back down the stairs. On the way, we told them about the phone call. My brother's friend took responsibility for it. My roommate believed him, but I didn't. I knew they wouldn't freak us out like that. They were just trying to calm us down. Once downstairs again, still shaking, we told one of our chaperones about the two men, and they freaked out. We told the front desk about the men, but since they didn't know which room they were in, or their names, they told us they couldn't do anything. They tried to reassure us that there was a group staying there, and that they were probably a part of it, and that they were probably leaving in a few days. But that didn't calm us down. But thankfully, we never did see them again. I was doing a geologist in the park through the National Park Service at Yellowstone back in the early 80s. It was a summer gig. First thing I do when I take groups around the mud pot geysers or any sort of thermal area, I tell them in no uncertain terms, stay on the boardwalk, don't put anything into the thermal features, don't throw trash, coins or put your hands or feet in. Stay on the boardwalk. Only take pictures, stay behind any barricades, leave only footprints on the boardwalk, and stay on the boardwalk. Although I didn't really have any sort of official power or legal standing beyond that of your average blue passport holder, I was large. Biker beard, corn fed, cheese head large. Loud and seriously into geology and preservation of a geologically unique area. Multitudinous times I had to warn people to stay on the boardwalk, to not throw anything into the thermal features, and the rest of the litany. And, for the most part, people would conform adding the usual amount of grumbling and grousing. 
until I took an all French group around on a blistering July afternoon. I spoke no French, but most of the tourists spoke some English, and one who volunteered to be my paravuchek du jour. I began with the official lines of don'ts, and these were all loudly translated into French for the whole group to hear. I even called out a few that were chatting amongst themselves, listen up, this is for your benefit, you digging me? And reviewed the list again. Anyone got any questions? Nods and mumbles of agreement about what I received from any groups. So off we go on the latest tour of geothermal wonders and geological splendor. About halfway through, there are always stragglers. So I halt the tour to wait for the dawdlers to catch up. Behind my back, I hear a commotion and see one of the beret sporting no beards off the boardwalk. What did I say? They're wandering closer to the glory pool to get a better picture or something like that. I get to the translator and ask him to scream to tell him to get back here, while three or four others decide it would be best to go and get him. General panic in Detroit moments until they all finally scarper back on the boardwalk, only to have one tourist tap me on the shoulder and ask if that person over there in the opposite direction should be there. There was yet another one of the group stalking a deer that wandered in wondering what all the commotion was about. Evidently, since he was heading away from the thermal feature, he would be just as safe as houses going off to photog the deer. He wasn't. The grounds around any thermal area are treacherous as hell. The water table shifts on a daily basis due to different thermal flux. Old Yellowstone caldera controls. So what may support you yesterday may be mere millimeters thick today. He broke through the crust and into the superheated geothermal heater water and mud, nature's napalm as they call it, up to about chest depth. I immediately called for rescue services via radio, told the French crowd not to move and stay there or be arrested, and I cautiously worked my way over towards him. We'd been trained for this sort of stuff and hoped to hell it would never happen to try and drag him out. It was touch and go, but belly crawling, swearing a blue streak and luck of the Irish prevailed. I got his arm and slowly dragged him out. He was screaming like a gaffed calf out on less vicious terrain. He lived, although with massive third degree burns, a hefty fine and his banning from US national parks for life. I am a 15 year old straight male. I live in Germany, but come from a smaller European country. This event happened before my move to Germany. In my country, we have field trips, usually at the end of eighth grade that last a week or so. Now I've had my fair share of stalker encounters, but nothing like this. It was September 2014. I went to a field trip on an island with my class. I was 14 at the time, and there was this girl, Jane. Jane used to be a normal girl up until that point. She was always kind of shy and really kept to herself, but everyone liked her. She was never bullied or anything, just a regular shy girl. We used to chat on Facebook a little bit, but nothing serious. I never really harbored any feelings towards her, neither in her favor nor against her. So back to the field trip. I've smoked a couple of cigarettes with my mates in our hotel room, and then we went outside. The teacher wanted to show us some plants that were specific for the area. Now, I noticed that Jane was talking to me more and more often than before, and that she'd been walking very near me. But I thought that was merely a coincidence. I didn't make a fuss about it. But as time went by, the things had started to get worse. She started touching me, hugging me, and following me. On the third day, we went on a cruise to a nearby island, and during the cruise, she was sitting next to me. She had a camera and was taking pictures of me. I've had zero sense of restraint at that point, 
since I was young and didn't think much about it. I noticed that she was taking a suspicious amount of pictures of mostly me, and I told her to calm down. Then, she spoke to me for about an hour, but didn't say anything of interest. She was mimicking the Irish and British accents to me, and basically blabbering stuff for approximately an hour. I was just smiling and replying with, that's nice. During the following days, she had began hugging me and began making me feel even more uncomfortable. So one day, I came to her and told her that we needed to talk in private. We went to the woods and I asked her if she liked me. She denied it and kept saying that there had been a misunderstanding, but I knew that there was something off about her. Then she told me her life story. She said that her mother is a schizophrenic and that she's severely depressed about it. I felt sorry for her, but I still told her that the touching was inappropriate. During my conversation, my friends wondered where I was and organized a search party. They found us and we got going, but she, for whatever reason, decided to stick around. There was one occasion where she came into our hotel room asking for water, as if there wasn't any in her own. However, when she got the requested water, she refused to leave the room. We got rid of her by telling her that we were going out to have some fun. The next day, things escalated. She would follow me around and hug me again. The peak of her abnormal behavior happened in the evening. I took a walk with a friend of mine and turned around briefly to see her behind us. She was following us. I kid you not, I've never felt this kind of dread in my entire life. My friend commented that we should go inside and let the police know I had a stalker as a joke. But anyway, she couldn't find us and gave up. My best friend heard the story and went to her to tell her to piss off. I wasn't very happy with him because I didn't expect him to be rude to her, regardless of her actions. I'm usually not meek, but I thought that that was horrible. Now I see that no matter how cruel it was, it was the right thing to do. I went to her room and apologized for my friend's actions. She was in her bed sobbing uncontrollably. I calmed her down and went outside. A female friend of mine, Sarah, had invited me to come into her room so that we could discuss something. I made my way to her room and saw two other girls there. We sat on the chairs in the balcony and she had told me that Jane is very depressed and had done some self-harming in the past. Amidst our conversation, I winced. I looked up and saw Jane about 50 meters away, just sitting on a rock, listening to music, staring at me. She had a solemn look in her eyes. I suddenly felt dismay and told my friends that we have a spectator. They winced too and we decided to pry on her a little bit before backing into the bedroom. Just stay away from her, was the last thing Sarah told me before I left. To my luck, it was the last day of our field trip and I finally got some rest. The weird encounters with her became less and less because she was often absent from school. Later, I found out that she had overdosed on sleeping pills a couple of times, but survived all of them. There was even a rumor that she had ended up in a psychiatric institution, but I have no proof of that, so I'm not entirely sure if it's right. Anyway, the point of this story is, you can be rude to someone to prevent something like this happening to you. It may seem cruel, or might even hurt the other person. But in the end, it's your life, and you have to stand up for yourself and make sure that you are happy. About the time I was 17 or so, a few friends and I were out at the beach making dry ice bombs in the middle of the night. This was probably around midnight or so, as we were quite delinquent back then. There were about five or six of us and we were just chilling, having a good time, trying to make potholes in the ground with dry ice bombs in the sand. It was quite a foggy night, 
which isn't too unusual considering I live in Oregon on the northwest coast, and it rains here 300 days out of the year. After 30 minutes or so of being rambunctious teenagers, we decided to walk down the beach a bit. After about 15 minutes of walking, we hear a strange scratching grinding sound and stop and listen. Sooner than 20 seconds later, a tall figure emerges out of the fog adjacent to the ocean but between us and the ocean. This guy had to be at least 8 foot tall, and it was dragging a chain. Not your average chain, but a massive chain that looked like it had been used for an anchor or something. The rings were probably at least 8 to 12 inches apiece, and it looked like they had to be at least an inch in diameter too. Now this chain wasn't short by any means, it was probably 40 to 50 feet long, and this dude was just dragging it in the sand behind him in the middle of the night. We all sat there silently, and I got the biggest shiver down my spine, and all my hair stood up on end, and my breath seemed to escape me. We gathered watching the figure cross our path, and make its way up the beach, and the chains slowly faded out of sight. Well, that was creepy as hell, I thought. We then continued back down the beach to a shipwreck called the Peter Iredale, which is all about but eroded now, and took to the cool sea spray to enjoy the ominous swishing of the serene ocean waves. We toss a few dry ice bonds into the water and head back to our car, where we parked probably half a mile up the shore. As we're walking, we hear the noise again. My heart thumps, and I get cold sweats. It was that thing, trudging the goddamn chain up the beach. It had to have been the exact same place where we saw it the first time. There were no drag marks in front of him, no footsteps, no indication that anyone had laid foot on the ground in front of him in the path that had previously been walked. The sand was dry, it wasn't washed over by waves or anything of the sort. We watched it for a moment out of curiosity, as to what the actual hell was going on. We stood there dumbfounded, watching the figure trudge through the sand with this unfathomably massive chain dragging behind it. It stopped dragging the Satan chain, and stared directly at us, piercing our soul and the essence of our being. We just stood there jaw dropped, staring back at this shadowy figure. It begins to slowly march towards us, and we booked it through the sand. I've never run so fast in my life. We all pile into the car, Bro turns the engine on, and we floor it out of there, easily hitting 80 miles an hour on the straight stretch of access road. We absolutely hold serious ass out there. The entire time, I was staring out the back window of the car. For some reason, expecting it to terminate her after us and catch up. Thankfully it didn't, and I never saw the shadowy figure again. It was the strangest, most heart-wrenching, terrifying thing I've ever seen. Neither of us were on any kind of drugs. We were all straight-edge kids, clean as a whistle, and shadow figures and chains scaring kids? Shame on them. A week or so later, a friend of ours who wasn't there that night told me that people used to practice black magic in the dunes there, and that there were artifacts of demonology and inverted crosses scattered about. I said his accusations were nonsense. Turns out it was all true. I went to the mum and asked her about it, and she said she had heard similar stories. So naturally we looked into it a bit, and then went out to search for said black magic devil worshipping sites. We were able to find some sort of inverted crosses, which were made of some sort of metal that was all but rusted over, and concrete blocks, probably a cubic meter in size in a few different places. Holes bored through them, and metal rings inserted through them, as if to be an anchor point. I put two and two together, and theorized that the chain was the one point connecting to these blocks in the dunes. For lord knows what purpose, I assumed that that creature was a black magic slash demonic summon, and I will never set foot on those cursed dunes again. 
Also, it turns out this is in the Oregon Ghost Stories book, which is chilling to have witnessed firsthand. It's certainly spooky stuff. As a law enforcement ranger for 30 seasons, I've seen some dumb stuff in the woods and some scary stuff. My worst was chasing down a guy who had escaped from a mental treatment facility. If he was just camping in the deep woods, I wouldn't have had an issue with him. But he was routinely stealing the gussets of women and girls swimsuits left to dry on lines in campgrounds and Girl Scout areas. The gusset I'm told is the cotton part of a suit that touches the outer labia and skin. It's like a soft cotton cloth sewn in for hygienic reasons, I'm told. One of the Girl Scout mums came running up to me as I was on patrol and told me she had seen the man run off on foot from the clothesline, so I gave chase. This was in the days before our handheld radios could transmit further than back to the truck, so I had one of those older girls go and make notifications to my office, and like a dummy, I took off running on the horse trail where I would see fresh prints. I ran two miles or so, and found a makeshift tent and campground set up. I also found cord and a linoleum knife and tape along with Ziploc gallon sized bags of these gussets. Clearly our thief was heading in a new direction. I'm convinced my intervention prevented a taking. My guy came out of the woods and I drew my service sidearm for our walk back. I had him handcuffed and in leg irons, with a lead drag so I could trip him by stepping on it. I also made him sing the Star Spangled Banner as we ran to keep him out of breath if he decided to fight. When you're that far in the woods and unsure if you have help coming, you need every advantage. My backup met us on the trail, and we were able to handcuff our prisoner to the bed of the pickup for the ride to the office. I had to sit in the bed with him for the trip. He wasn't much of a chatter. The guys went back to clean out the site. He'd been there for a while, and was definitely a bit of a time bomb. We didn't pursue anything criminal, but he was committed someplace in Ulster County, at a max security psych facility, until his passing. I used to put money on his commissionery every now and again, but I doubt he remembered me. You can't hold a mentally disabled person accountable for stuff they do. If he got a few snicker bars or some socks to make his life feel a tad more bearable, so be it. He was away from anyone he could hurt, and receiving treatment can't punish him more. My wife also found the notebook that the original story was in. I used to keep notes for court to refresh my memory. At the time that this occurred, the guy was 28 and diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and bipolar. He'd been released from a mental health hospital lockdown with the promise he would take his meds. 230 swimsuits and panty gussets were recovered and a few training bras. He seemed to prefer small or young females. I had forgotten that he ended the life of a deer and a goose via wire traps and then bludgeoned them with rocks. At the time I carried a Smith Wesson 686 revolver in 357 Magnum with 158 GR hollow points. I didn't have a vest, just a t-shirt and button down shirt, so not much protection from his weapon in the thick pines. I had been at my cousin's wedding which was across the country. We had to stay at a hotel at the time. We'd been up since 8am and spent the whole day celebrating. So everyone was tired. My dad had been drinking and wasn't able to drive us back to the hotel. So my mum, my sister and I made plans to get a lift from my auntie and uncle. My dad and my brother went with my other auntie and uncle. So anyway, we had left the venue and had been driving for about 10 minutes, down a dark, deserted one-way road. Everything was fine. I was sitting in the back seat with my mum and sister, and we were all just chatting, 
although I was half asleep. That was until my uncle cursed under his breath and the car slowed down. This woke me up fully, because I knew that the road was very long, and there were only trees on the sides of it. Also, I was young, and I believed that cursing was a terrible sin. When the car stopped completely, I sat up a bit, trying to see what was going on. Then I saw a man walking towards the car. This couldn't have been as scary as it was if it wasn't pitch black in the middle of nowhere, and if the man didn't have a load of glass shards in his face. It was a horrifying sight. There were pieces of glass in his skin. It was so bloody. There was even a big shard sticking out of his cheek. He knocked on the window and motioned for my auntie to roll down hers. She rolled it down a little bit. What do you want? My uncle asked. Could you give me and my friend a ride to the hospital? The man with the glass in his face asked. Friend? I thought to myself. I couldn't see another man. And that's when a second man walked out from the bushes. He also had glass in his face. It was so bloody. The second man walked over to the driver's side of the car, where my uncle was, and he asked my uncle to roll down his window as well. My uncle complied, but like my auntie, only rolled it down a little bit. Can you please give us a ride? I'm sorry, but there isn't any room, my auntie said. The first man looked to the back seat, as if he didn't believe my auntie, and we made eye contact. It was probably the scariest five seconds I've ever experienced. Just then he pulled on the handle of the car door and it opened. This is when I started to panic, and I could feel my mum tense up. My auntie struggled with the man to try and close the door. Luckily enough, the man seemed like he had been drinking, so he wasn't as strong as he would have been if he was sober. The second man didn't seem to be doing much. He just seemed to be watching the whole thing play out. Finally, my aunt was able to close the door and lock it. Just take this, I'm sorry. My auntie scrambled for her purse and pulled out a 20 euro note. I can't remember if the man took it or not. The last thing I do remember about the night was my uncle driving away as fast as he could. I just spoke to my sister who was 16 at the time. Apparently her and my mum never told me this part, but I was really freaking out at the time and they didn't want to make it worse. Off on the side of the road, they had spotted multiple figures hiding amongst the bushes and trees. Who knows how many people were actually there, but they guess at least two or three. What made it scarier was the next 20 minutes left on the deserted road. We all sat there digesting what could have happened. In her words, I don't know what they were planning, but I'm glad we never found out. When I was about seven years old, I was a member of a scouting movement. I didn't really enjoy it, to be honest, since I was never really a sociable kid. But my parents figured that if I tried it for a while, I might make some friends and have some fun. I don't exactly remember everything of what I did there but I have a vague memory of myself playing with friends on Sunday afternoons. One memory has stayed vivid throughout the years though. As usual, it was a Sunday afternoon. It was a snowy mid-December day, and I and the rest of the kids were playing a game of tag with our supervisors outside the building. Let me situate the area a bit. The building was at the end of a road that led to a village. The building itself was surrounded by potato fields, and there was a small but lush forest on top of a hill behind the building. Like I said, it was cold, and everything was covered in a thick layer of snow. You also couldn't see more than about a hundred feet ahead of you, because there was a fog that accompanied the snowfall. I honestly don't understand why they didn't keep us inside and let us play there. So the game of tag started, and a group of friends and I ran towards the back of the building. Most of the kids were in the front of the building, and there was a higher chance of getting tagged there. 
so we figured we'd go to the back to increase our survival chances, even when the supervisors didn't allow us to go there. The group consisted of three other kids, the ones I had most contact with. When we all arrived at the back of the building, we quietly stood behind the wall so that supervisor nor kid alike could know that we were there. I recall closing my eyes and faintly hearing the kids screaming in the background. The building was pretty long, so I figured we must have been around 82 feet away from the rest. While one of my friends was checking to see if no one was coming our way, I was talking to the other two of the group. However, we weren't talking for long, as quickly after that, we heard the sound of a branch snapping coming from the small woods in front of us. Between us and the woods was about 32 feet of grassland covered in snow, and we were still little kids, so we were expecting some wild animal to run towards us. But one of the kids brushed it off and told us to focus on the game. When I looked back at the tree line about 10 seconds later, there was a man next to one of the thin birch trees with his left hand placed on the tree. I remember that the man was wearing a black coat and a pair of jeans. He was bold and it was hard to make out his facial features. At first I screamed and the other kids asked me what was wrong. I pointed my finger at the man that was standing next to the tree. They all screamed too, but our screams must not have been loud, because no supervisor came rushing towards us. The man kept standing at the tree not moving an inch. One of the kids stated that we should hurry back to the rest of the group as fast as possible. My heart was racing and I could barely move. Just like in one of those dreams in which you want to run away from something, but you can't. As I kept staring at the man, it looked as if skin had grown over his eyes and his mouth looked wider, wider than what is considered normal. Then out of bloody nowhere, the man slowly starts walking towards us. I remember that I somehow had the courage to scream at it. It didn't say anything back. We certainly didn't want to wait for the man to reach us either. So we ran to the front of the building where the rest of the group was. Once we reached the rest of the kids, one of the kids in the group ran inside to the senior supervisor. I turned around to look at it again, but when I did, the man was gone. All I saw was the tree line in our footsteps in the snow. Some time later, three supervisors, including the senior supervisor, went to look behind the building. They came back saying they didn't see anything and that it was all right. We got a warning because we cheated. And they told our parents about the incident. Ever since, I think about it once in a while and I wonder who or what it was and what would have happened if I'd have stayed there frozen in fear in the snow behind the building? After the incident, I think it's no surprise that I quit the scout movement. When I was seven or eight, my family went to the beach and rented a hotel room. We had the kind of rooms that you rent out both and they connect through a door. There's one door to leave the room and there is the door in between that connects the rooms individually. In the room connecting to ours, there was an army family, military father, some kids and a wife. My older sister was supposed to be watching me as we were down at the jacuzzi during the evening, as we're just playing and hanging out and having a good time. I didn't get out much, was naive and a little kid. And to give a little description, we're both white skinned, blue eyed blondes. Then, this person sits in the jacuzzi with us. She starts conversing with us and is just making herself very comfortable. I was very naive as a kid, and eventually we started talking books, and she's talking about her kids, who we haven't seen yet. 
We are having a really good conversation. I felt like it was very in depth and my sister decides she wants to go back to the room. But I don't. I wanted to stay and talk with this lady. So my sister goes back to the room and now it's just seven year old me and some 40 year old woman. It should have set off some creepy alarm bells, but it did not. She just starts talking about going and walking on the beach. It's about 10 PM and she wants to go on the walk and get shells. I thought it was a great idea. I'd get to walk on the beach at night. I felt so free and like a big kid. I didn't need my sister or anything. So I run back to the room to tell my grandparents that I'm walking on the beach with Sue or whatever her name was. I remember my grandmother reading her book, barely listening to what I said, and she just shook me off. It's important to know I didn't live with my parents. So I start walking down the corridor that was really dark and dim as it was quite cheap. I'm going through the stairwell like something out of a movie. Too bad I'd never seen this movie. As I'm walking through it, the woman is at the bottom telling me to hurry up. While walking through the stairs, army dad comes running down and asks where I'm going. He told me, your mum is calling you. It's really important. We got to go and basically grabbed me by the wrist softly and led me back to our room. He knocked on our door and explained what had happened. I never thought much about it until a year ago when it came back to me. This woman was leading me away to the beach alone at night and this army guy got a terrible feeling in his gut. So he intervened. When he said my mum was looking for me and I don't live with my mum, it set off some alarm bells in my head. That's when I realized something was up. So I didn't resist going back to my family. As a kid, I knew since he was saying my mum wanted me, it was important. I just knew something was up because I don't live with her. I'm now 20 years old and I truly believe that this woman was trying to lure me away to do God knows what. And this army dude had a bad feeling and saved my life. Thinking back, I get such a bad feeling all throughout my body. I now know that I wouldn't have made it back from that beach trip. Thank you, army dude. Your gut feeling and having a watchful eye saved something terrible from happening to me. That woman was creepy. We never even saw her kids. This happened three years ago. Back when I was in ninth grade, 14 years old at the time, me and several classmates were on a school trip to a nearby city, which was a five hour trip from home. We were accompanied by two teachers from our school and we were going to stay there for three nights, specifically in a hotel. Our purpose for going there was to attend a regional invention contest and exhibition, which was only held once every two years. Our hotel wasn't a very big one. It only had two floors. Right next to the hotel was a 7-Eleven, which is a convenience store. And a short walk from there is the school where the exhibition is held. As the total kids that we were, we were restless in that city, especially the 7-Eleven, which we didn't have back in our small town. We would often hang out there on our free time and the fact that it was open 24 hours meant we could go whenever we wanted. One night, me and two close friends of mine and four other classmates decided to have a midnight snack at that very same 7-Eleven. It was around 10 PM and most of the stores in the city had already closed. There were very few people walking around and we were probably the only kids walking around at that time. Our teachers warned us about going out late at night, but I guess we were too stubborn to listen. The 7-Eleven was empty, aside from one small man, probably in his 20s, who was manning the cash register. We each brought a small snack for ourselves and had a chat with each other for a few minutes. The street outside was still empty and so was the store. While I was looking through the sweets and chocolate aisle, 
I overheard a masculine voice near the tables where my classmates were sitting. I went over and saw a different man between the ages of 30 to 40 talking to two of my female classmates and another male classmate in the same table. He was fairly large, wore a green t-shirt and khaki pants. He also had a tattoo on his right arm, but unfortunately, I couldn't remember what the tattoo looked like. He introduced himself as Bob Leo, I'm pretty sure that was made up, and told my classmates that he was a musician, and tried to sing a few lyrics from the Bob Marley song, No Woman, No Cry, which was clearly off tune. I stood behind one aisle occasionally glancing over and quietly listening to their conversation. My classmates tried to talk back, but the sound of their voice hinted that they were feeling uncomfortable. Meanwhile, my male classmates stood close by. Some of them tried to talk to Bob Leo in order to give my classmates time to slip past him. By then, I was already holding my phone getting ready to call our teachers. But then Bob Leo called out to me and my friends, asking us to take as many soft serve ice creams as we wanted from the store, as we were getting treated by his friends, pointing outside to the two other men sitting outside the store staring at us. We slowly went over to the cashier, and he handed us three ice creams. As he handed me the last ice cream, he whispered to me, telling me to leave immediately, along with my classmates, as he will try and distract them. I gave the ice creams to the, my other classmates, and I looked over and saw one of my friends talking to the men outside. Apparently, he was the closest to the exit, and when he tried to leave, he was stopped by the two men. I couldn't hear what they were talking about at the time and I told my other classmates what the cashier had told me, and he told the rest. While Bob was still talking, one of my male classmates went over to the female one and invited her to leave, acting like her boyfriend. Another did the same to my other female classmate. I opened my phone and acted like I'd received a text message from our teacher, telling us to return to our hotel room. Bob tried to stall us, this time more assertive, but we were already on our way out. As I walked out, I grabbed my friend by the shoulder and told him we were leaving. The two men also tried stopping us, grabbing my friend by the hand, but he slid past. They said that they were teachers of the school that we were attending the exhibition at, but when I asked about the event, they couldn't answer. As we were walking down the path, one of them yelled something in their native tongue, which translates to in English, damn, we almost got them. We left in a hurry, with my female classmates shaking. When we got back, the girls started sobbing, and we talked to them about it. I asked my friends what he and the two men were talking about, but he told me it was just nonsense and lies. We told our teachers what happened, and they spoke to the police about it. The next day, we weren't allowed to leave at night anymore. We never got to thank the cashier before we went home, but we left him a small token of our appreciation. As for Bob Leo and his creepy friends, let's not meet. Back in September, I was taking hunter education classes with my dad. Basically, you learn parts of a gun, how to handle a gun safely. Since it was in person and not the online classes, the instructors had stories to tell. These were about people not handling theirs correctly, drunk shooting, and the like. And as you can imagine, most of them didn't end well. We were going shooting a lot these two weeks to prepare for the test at the end. One time we went to an abandoned town that a lot of people shot at. It had been shut down due to high lead levels. I had butterflies, and the whole ride I brushed it off as nerves. That evening, we were the only ones there. We thought it would be pretty nice since there'd be more spots open. 
We settled on a spot behind a hill and shot another hill nearby. My dad was sighting the 22 gun we had brought and I was sitting behind him. My earplugs were in, so it was hard to hear things, especially far away. When all of a sudden, there was a very loud shot. It had to have been my dad since it was so close to him and loud. I was initially scared, as the previously mentioned stories we were told of shots being accidentally fired never ended well. In a concerned voice, I asked if it was my dad. When he said no, my fear became much greater. Another shot was fired, and our only thought was to become seen. We quickly unloaded the gun so it was safe and ran up the hill. My mum was wearing yellow, and we were all jumping up and down waving our arms. There was no way we couldn't have been seen. After two or three more shots, we ran to the edge. It was like a valley or dried out lake. The edges were very high, and we were at the bottom with the shooter at the top. The next part confirmed our belief that they had seen us, and still continued anyway. My dad called the police to report what was happening. He walked further out to see details like the color of the truck and how many people, and was in the view of the shooter. Just a bit after my dad got on the phone, the guy left, probably assuming the cops and other authorities were called. We wished we had brought the gun, because we were convinced he was shooting at us. We stayed where we were for a long time waiting for the police, when a group of maybe four high schoolers came. My dad went and warned them about the previous events, and we decided after 15 minutes of waiting, and no police arriving, and we just wanted to get out of there. We went avid, gathered our stuff, and I looked at where the shots had went, with some goggles, and something that told distance. The shots were no more than 25 meters away. If he had bumped the gun just a bit, we would have been dead or in the hospital. Driving away, the police finally came. They asked us some questions, and we were finally able to get the hell out of there. He was unfortunately never caught, and we never went back there. We don't know if he was trying to mess with us, trying to shoot us, or just drink. But we were terrified for our lives. First, some background. I'm a 22 year old college senior, about to graduate and start medical school in the fall. This happened when I was in elementary school, so over a decade ago. Over the summer, way back then, my mum sent me to YMCA summer camp. I enjoyed going in every day and hanging out with all my friends from school who also went to the camp but I especially loved one of the counsellors, Mike. Mike was always sitting in the same spot when I got dropped off in the morning, and he would see me walk in and put a huge smile on his face. He would always sit there and play cards or some other board game in the morning while all of the kids were arriving. Once the day's scheduled activities started, Mike would always be the counsellor in charge of my group. He would always just be close to me. As a kid, I didn't know that was weird. I really liked him, as I said, and I thought he was a really cool guy as an eight-year-old. Fast forward a few years. My mum, my younger sister and I were out at a skate park in the area, about a half hour from where we lived. We had gone down there to hang out for the day. We have a great time on the playground, walk around the trails and stuff and then we head back to the car. When we arrived back, my mum was getting my sister all strapped in and ready for the ride home, and I was getting situated in the back seat of the car. Now our car was in the parking lot, and there weren't really a ton of people at the park that day. The lot was pretty much empty. So when I noticed that there was a car parked right next to our car, I thought, that's weird. But again, I was a kid and didn't really think anything of it. Why would this car park literally right next to us when I can see 50 empty spots from right here? Anyway, my mum is getting my sister and I'm all ready for the trip back home. Suddenly, the driver door of the other car opens 
and out pops Mike. My mum recognised him, so she said hi, and continues back to what she was doing. Mike says, Do you mind if I take a couple of pictures of the kids? He's gotten so grown, and I want to remember this. My mum goes, No, you're not going to do that, and shuts the driver's door, and locks the car and we leave. As we're leaving, I can see Mike trying to take a photo through the window of the car. A few years later, when I was a bit older, my mum told me a few more details about Mike. My mum at the time was pretty high up in a company that pairs kids with adult mentors. Adults would be applied to be paired with kids. So my mum starts telling me about how one day when they were going through the applications to be a mentor, Mike's name popped up. Apparently someone else had interviewed Mike and recommended him for approval into our system. My mum on the other hand, essentially vetoed it because she obviously had known Mike from these other experiences and she got a weird vibe from him and thought something was off. So finally, we're watching the news at dinner one day a bit later. They start sharing a story about a man who was arrested and they show a mugshot of Mike. The charge? Thousands of images. Thousands of indecent images of underaged children that both he had made and was in possession of. He was actually caught by Border Patrol as he was acting weird when he was trying to cross into Canada and they decided to search his car and they found a bunch of it on his computer. They alerted the US authorities who then searched his house and they found tons more. I'm 100% confident that he wanted to add me to the collection. If it's not for my mum having a great mother's instinct and the Canada-US border, it might have happened. Summer Camp Counselor Mike, please, let's never meet again. I'm a teenager. Me and my mother live alone. We live basically in the middle of nowhere. The nearest town is less than an hour away and the only things we have near us are a gas station and a bar. I know everyone who lives near me, and we rarely ever see new people in our neck of the woods. So just seeing someone who isn't familiar is suspicious enough. So this was pretty creepy. A few years ago, it was the middle of the night. Me and my mother are night owls. We like to be awake from midnight to 6am, the time most people prefer to sleep. My mother was watching TV in the living room and I was using the computer in the kitchen. The kitchen and the living room are basically connected. So I wasn't too far away from her, only a few feet. The front door leads right into the living room. It's a door with nine windows, so it's pretty easy to see into. My mum looked towards the door and she saw someone staring at her through the window. He was wearing a hood that obscured almost all of his face. My mum jumped, and she of course walked into the door and asked what the hell he was doing. According to my mother, he looked pretty young, but she could barely see his face, so who knew how old he was? The man said something along the lines of, Can you help me with my car, please? in a tone I can only describe as miserable and off-putting. Even though it was dark out, there should have been enough light for her to see a car, and there was no car. The man was also holding his pockets pretty tightly. My mother apologized and said no. This caused him to grip whatever was in his pockets tighter still, so tight his arms began to tremble. He stayed for a few more minutes, and then he had swiftly disappeared. Throughout the night, maybe one or two hours later, we thought we'd hear slight weeping, but we didn't see anyone at any of our doors and windows. I may be making assumptions here, but I can only assume it was a weapon he was holding in his pockets. This was a creepy as hell experience, and it's safe to say he was going to lure my mother out of the house to do something sinister to her. A year ago, there was a very small metal plate 
jammed between the front door strike plate and the piece that goes inside of it. I'm not sure what it's called. We have zero idea where this metal plate came from, but the metal plate stopped our doors from locking. So I'm assuming it was just put there so that someone could get in. These things are probably unrelated, but it made me think of him because this was deliberately placed there by someone and we're not sure why. This story happened in the late 90s. I was around 11 or so. At the time, I was a member of the Boy Slash Girl Scouts. In Germany, Boy and Girl Scouts are not separated from each other. So I spent a lot of my childhood in the forest. We camped in the local woods quite a lot and often told each other other creepy stories right before bedtime. Of course, we always claimed our stories to be true and such. And from an early age, you'll believe nearly everything. These stories evolved over the years. And one of them, which started with a simple, there's a creepy homeless man living in the woods, became worse and worse and ended up being something like, there's a creepy homeless man living in the woods. He catches children and eats them. One of them even claimed he knew exactly where this guy lived. And after a small argument, we decided to look for ourselves. So we waited until the adults were asleep and slipped out of our tent. We knew we were not allowed to, and this increased our excitement even more. The best part of it, girls like to hold hands. And when they're scared in a pitch black forest with only two flashlights and no one else around, it just took about a minute until the first one grabbed my arm. We walked through the woods for at least 40 minutes and then saw it. A big blue tent covered in leaves with wood piles around it. It looked old and rotten and we saw bottles and trash lying around. Every single one of us was scared to death. One of the girls started crying and most of us just wanted to go back. But a few boys said that there's no one living in there and to prove it, they grabbed sticks and rocks and threw them at the tent. At first, nothing happened. But then we heard swearing and the whole tent was moving. Suddenly a man jumped out. I can remember him quite clearly. Many layers of clothing and long hair. He was furious, yelling, swearing, and all excitement was gone and we ran as fast as we could. The girls and most of the boys were crying when we finally reached our camp, but we decided to not tell anyone. Back in our tent, we tried to sleep, but none of us could. Some girls were still crying and we were all scared that the man followed us. It took us nearly the whole night to calm down, but at this point, the night was still quite nice for me. The girl who grabbed my arm earlier came over and crawled into my sleeping bag with me. She was shaking and scared, but I never felt so cozy and comfortable before. It took me nearly seven years to get another girl this close to me. A few weeks later, my parents talked about the newspaper and this gave me the chills. The local police arrested a man who lived in the woods for two years. He had escaped prison. He broke into nearby houses to get food and money, and this is how he got caught in the end. We never spoke to our parents about it, and they never caught whiff of what we did. So creepy hobo in the woods, maybe you never ate kids, but let's not meet again. Little backstory here to how I learned my lesson that nature doesn't mess around. Arkansas, the natural state resident here, I do a side job called trail running. There's a whole bunch of names for it. It's where we work with a tour guide escorting a group by scouting out the nature location a few days in advance to see if there are any hindrances to said nature attractions such as floods, creeks or fallen trees. Usually I hunt waterfalls because there's about 300 in Arkansas and they attract tourists, but most of them have no trail to get to the location. So I document a path. This isn't a foolproof strategy, as I get off course sometimes by miles. 
I also preferred traveling by myself and doing the job alone. That was a big mistake, as I also enjoyed the isolation, but sometimes I'd have a friend tag along since they wanted a little money. We don't know what to expect when we search for a path, so to protect against wildlife and the elements, we essentially are armed to the teeth. Our kit involved kneecaps, high steel wading boots, two machetes, flare guns, you get the gist. Now for the story. I had one job finding another way to a waterfall called Bowers Hollow, as the main trail was flooded since the waterfall season is from October to August and it rains a lot. I found a back road that gets me to the marked forest area, except the road was no longer a road but a mudslide of some sort, and had wiped out the road a long time ago. The road snakes down into a canyon, and the mudslide hit the road multiple times causing me to have to disembark my vehicle, as it was only starting to flatten out from water, slowly removing dirt that I could cross it by foot. After two hours of hiking down, I came by across a flooded creek that's usually a good sign because it means there's a waterfall nearby. I hiked downstream for about three miles, and came across an old Subaru SUV. The vehicle had clearly been there a long time and had scratch marks on the rusted exterior. The vehicle also had an Ontario Canada license plate, meaning that the person probably wasn't familiar with Arkansas wilderness. The right back window was smashed thoroughly, with glass in the interior of the car, and bits of cloth on the shattered glass still on the window. The left back window was cracked badly, and had not shattered just yet, but was bending outwards in the shape of the top of a head. There were black spotches all over the degraded interior of the car. To the left of the car facing downstream was an untouched campsite with old cans and rocks arranged into the campfire with obvious signs it was untouched for years. I knew that this probably occurred a long time ago, maybe before I was even born as I was 18 at the time. But I got out of there pretty quickly, concluded with my trail guide that a mountain lion had probably attacked a person in their sleep, and marked the zone as dangerous wildlife, and have never taken a job in that area since. This happened about seven years ago. I was staying at my friend Diana's house. She lives pretty close to a small beach, which is really more of a vague shoreline but it's still nice. We both enjoy going on adventures, so one night we decided to go for a walk, and ended up walking along the shore. Her dog Penny was with us, occasionally running out into the water, doing cute dog things. I'm not a huge dog person, so I'm not sure what kind of dog she was, but she was a medium-sized dog. Not big, but way too big to be called small. We were only there for 10 minutes, before we heard a twig snap from the forest at the edge of the shore. Both of us froze, listening to see if we could hear anything. We thought we heard someone shushing someone else. But we brushed it off as being paranoid, and remained on high alert. The tide was coming in, and there was only one way back to safety. A single path, which we had come down on. Everywhere else was essentially a cliff, covered in thorns and whatnot. Not fun to climb. We started making our way back to the path, taking our shoes off since we realized we waited too long and wouldn't make it before the water reached us. As we were walking, we heard more twigs snapping in the forest and hushed voices. We looked at each other and paused. Diana asked me what we should do, and I really didn't know. Everyone at her home was asleep, so we couldn't call them, and we didn't want to call the police if it wasn't a dangerous situation. I ended up telling her we had no choice. We had to make it to the path before the tide came in. We start again, picking up the pace a little, coaxing Penny along with us. It's at this moment that we heard a growl and a low bark, followed quickly with more shushing sounds. I could hear the voices, though I don't remember what I heard them say. There were two men, and they had a dog. There are no houses this close to the shore. Diana's house is the closest, 
and it's a good five minute walk away. The forest that surrounds the shore is pretty thick, and it's not good for camping in. There's no viable reason for someone to just be hanging out there. We both registered this and start to run. I heard one of the men yell, Go get him! And heard the dog's collar jingle as it started to run. Penny was right behind us, so when we saw the silhouette of a dog in front of us, we knew it wasn't her. The dog started growling, and Penny was bouncing around playfully behind us, clearly not sensing this dog's aggression, as she was a very young dog. We stood still, unaware of what to do. The sound of twigs breaking was getting closer, and Diana carefully knelt down to get a rock and tossed it towards the forest, to which the dog and Penny went chasing after it. Diana was worried about Penny, but we both kept running and hardly stopped for a breath. When we made it to the path, before the tide I might add, we could see flashlight beams in the forest and heard the men cursing and clumsily maneuvering their way through the branches. We called for Penny as silently as we could, but she never came. We ended up having to leave without her as the men were getting too close. We ran back to her house and locked the door, and haven't talked about what happened since. Penny showed up the next morning perfectly fine, in case anyone was wondering. I've had a few strange encounters with sketchy people, but this one was the only time I ever felt truly in danger. In my graduation year of high school, the class went to a trip to a beach town. I was always a loner in school, and the only friends I had in school didn't go to this trip. I never really interacted much with my classmates. At this point in the trip, we are about 21 people, and we're left in a famous seaside street filled with bars and restaurants. We were allowed to be free and have fun and eat and drink whatever we wanted. It was night time and we could do as we pleased in that street until midnight. This is not the US by the way, and I'm not even sure if this is allowed in the US. My classmates started grouping up and choosing places to eat and drink, and despair took over me, as I hated grouping up. As always I was alone, and decided to wander around to find a place to have dinner alone. Looking at the restaurants, I found a really cute one that served artisanal pasta, and it was empty. An old man was almost begging for people to come and take a look. I was such a good guy before this trip, that I couldn't say no to eating there, and to make the old guy and the owner happy. As I ate my tagliatelle with octopus, which is the worst dish I've ever had, a hobo sat at the floor by me, and started chatting. I was such a good guy that I thought, oh poor hobo, I don't need to pretend that he's invisible, he's a person just like me, and I chatted back. He asked if the food was good, and when the owner saw the hobo, they came right away yelling at him to leave, and I was like, now it's fine, we're chatting, and they gave up. The hobo said he was hungry, and if I could buy him food. I said yes. He told me he had a restaurant that he really liked, and he would like food from there. I offered him money, and he denied it, and said he couldn't buy the food himself because the people there don't like him. I was such a nice guy, that I said sure, let me finish here and I'll go buy it for you. He waited patiently, and when I was done he guided me there. We passed by the most populous part of the street, where some of the others were, and a classmate, that I should allow myself to call a friend now, asked where I was going with the hobo. I said I was going to buy him food, and that it was okay. She didn't appear to accept it, but I proceeded following the hobo. It was getting further away, the street was becoming darker, and with less restaurants. I told the hobo, Are you sure it's around here? There doesn't appear to be any restaurants anymore. He assured me it was just round the corner. Just as we exchanged these words, I heard someone screaming my name in the distance. It was that friend. Michael, what are you doing there? Come back here right away. She appeared really distressed. 
Still clueless, I thought she also needed my help, or had something to tell me. I told the hobo that my friend was calling and that I needed to go over there. But we're almost arriving. I have to go. And I ran to her. Are you crazy? What, are you out of your mind? I've been asking around and that hobo is a super dangerous criminal around here. Come right back with me. And I was saved by that friend from what could have been a horrible end to me or worse. From that day, I learned a valuable lesson. Be an ass. I'm not a good guy for everyone anymore. I pretend hobos don't exist, and I don't help random people around. From that day, I learned a valuable lesson. Basically, don't be naive, and don't be so nice to people. I was a wildland firefighter back in the day in Arizona. I worked in a forest that was generally populated with a lot of recreation in the northern part. But I worked on the southern portion of the forest that was really remote. It barely had any roads or campgrounds. So if you wanted to recreate there, you had to work for it. The fire crew I was in had two duty stations, one in a small town where the rest of the forest employees worked off and one that was about 2.5 hours away, up a really windy mountainous road. The remote duty station had an old forest service ranger station, and a newer double wide trailer that was recently put in. When I worked at this place, it had no cell reception. When my crew and I weren't working, they were playing horseshoes or watching movies. They did eventually add a cell phone booster, which sadly made more people play on their phones, but I digress. So, my supervisor from that crew had experienced some weird things working up there. There was one night he told me he was cowboy camping, which is sleeping outside with no tent, and he kept getting this weird mucusy drop of liquid land on his face. He kept looking around and even yelling and no one was around him. He told me he wasn't below any trees, so it wasn't tree sap. He never slept outside there again, which leads me to believe he was telling the truth. My own story? I've had other interesting experiences at that remote duty station, but this one was scary. It was the night of the 4th of July, and we weren't on a fire, so the crew was playing horseshoes and having a good time. Everyone went to bed pretty early because we were going to have a hike the next day. I had my own small room in the double white trailer, and my bed was situated next to a big window. I start dozing off, but I felt awake still. I hear my co-worker standing outside my window asking to come outside. I was laying on my side facing the window, and I didn't look up, but I felt their presence by it. It felt as though something tall was looming over me from the outside. They kept beckoning me and I said no. Pretty quickly their voice started changing into a deeper, raspier and angry voice. They started cursing at me to get the hell out. I just froze. It was a sort of demonic voice. I lay frozen, not moving, while they yelled at me. Eventually it stopped and I fell asleep. I woke up the next day and wanted to ask my co-worker if he was standing outside my window, but I felt too weird. Perhaps this was a mild form of sleep paralysis, but still weird. When I was 17 slash 18, I was driving home from a friend's house after a movie marathon. It was around 1am when I left for a decent drive. Not quite halfway, my gas light came on. I had a few creepy catcall experiences at gas stations, and was a little paranoid stopping that late in the middle of nowhere, as a 110 pound teenage girl. In the end, I think if I wasn't so cautious, I could have been taken or worse. The first gas station I came across was well lit, and in a pretty open space. I drove up to the pump, and looked around my car mirrors before getting out. As I was starting to pump gas, this normal looking guy comes out of the gas station shop and starts smoking a cigarette. The pump 
kept clicking off and not working. So I started messing with it to try to get it to pump. This guy starts watching me laughing. I assumed he was just laughing to himself, watching a teenage girl trying to pump gas. And after getting maybe a quarter of a gallon, I gave up and moved to a new pump. At this point, if I didn't do absolutely everything I did, I would have been screwed. When I got back into my car, I locked my doors just to drive to the other pump. I checked all of my mirrors before getting out and shutting the car off. An old 90s beetle that didn't always start right away. That's when I saw the guy walking up to my car. He was smiling, walking up to the driver's side window. Not wanting him next to me, I rolled down the passenger window and he paused for a moment then smiled to himself and walked to the passenger window. He stuck his head all the way inside my window to talk to me. Hey, I know this seems really weird. My car broke down and I need a ride home. It's just a half mile up the road. Sorry, I don't know you. Oh, no, I, I totally get it. I just thought it was pretty weird as I was walking up here. But it's only a half mile up the road and I'm totally stranded. I wish I could help you out, but I really don't know you. Yeah, I got you. If you had a truck or something, I'd offer a ride in the back. Sorry, no. All of a sudden, he looks pissed. He yanked at my door, but I had locked it. Then he reached for my inside door handle through my window. My car was still running, and I slammed it into first and peeled out as he opened the door. The car taking off slammed it shut and I sped off and called the police as I got away. They looked at the gas station cameras and right after I left, he got into his red SUV and drove off. If I hadn't have locked my doors the second time, I would have been screwed. If I'd have let him come to the driver's side window, he would have grabbed me. And if I'd have shut my car off, I wouldn't have been able to drive off in time. If I didn't double check my mirrors, I would have been outside my car when he came up to me. I've barely spoken about this since it happened two years ago. I was 16 and on an excursion to a small town in Zambia for two weeks. I'm from Ireland and I was with nine other students. The two weeks entailed painting a primary school showing disabled kids how to work and meeting locals and visiting their villages. It was great and unforgettable and something I'll treasure for the rest of my life. One of the days we visited a coffee farm. It was located in a beautiful location up upon high hills. We were getting a tour and exploring when the owner of the coffee farm, a European man comes to meet us. I'm purposely being vague in order to conceal his identity. He invites us back into his house. We all get into our cars and drive. I can't describe it to you. His lane we drove took about 30 minutes. It was surrounded by water and was beautiful. It looked like paradise. When we reached his house, right away it was weird. He kept all the dark skinned people outside. The ones who worked for him and our driver who should have been considered guests. All but one maid he joked about being his second wife. Laughing and wrapping his arm around her when she looked more than uncomfortable. And he gave us a quick tour of his mansion before he brought us into his living room. I remember it vividly. I sat on the couch directly opposite the fireplace. My girlfriend was on this trip too, and she was sitting next to me. He told her to move, and he came and sat next to me. He started sharing stories about his life here in Zambia, and boosting about his wealth and whatnot. Every time he spoke, he would gesticulate, and his hand would brush against my breast. The first time I thought it was a mistake, but a few minutes passed, and it kept happening and his hand would graze my thigh. His maid brought in tea, and he asked who the youngest on the trip was. It was me. He instructed me to pour tea out for everyone. 
I had to get on my knees and pour tea out, and I did it. And once that was done, he continued until we left. I think everyone noticed it, but no one said or acknowledged it, and that he was humiliating me. He was touching me and getting away with it in front of my girlfriend, peers and teachers. My girlfriend kept mouthing for me to move away, but I didn't want to bring further attention to it. I felt frozen in place, I suppose. So that was it. We drove back and I felt disgusting and ashamed, knowing that everyone saw it. Writing this, I looked him up out of curiosity and seeing his face made me more anxious than I thought it would. I haven't really let myself think about it until now. Luckily, I'll never have to meet him again. My memories of this incident fade in and out. I grew up in Germany, and it must have been 92 or 3. Once a year, my class would go on a school trip, and it was during my second or third year. So I must have been about eight or nine. Enrollment is from age six in Germany, but I enrolled at age seven. Our next trip was somewhere in Lower Saxony. I can't remember where. Each room had four bunk beds by the doors and a recreational area at the end of the room. It had large windows and a glass door to open it. Well, as kids do, we joked around and stayed up longer than permitted. It was actually so dark outside that it scared us, so we kept the curtain shut. A classmate of mine played a daring game, hiding behind the curtains and tearing them open. Dennis decided to run outside and frighten the others next door, which he did. The next thing I remember is Dennis back in our room and we saw something moving outside. We start to panic and told our teacher. She told us to calm down, closed the curtains and left. Dennis was curious and found it extremely funny to run outside again. The next thing I remember is me standing outside because I was worried about him. Some guy picked him up and vanished into the darkness. I couldn't see a thing. So I called his name and a few moments later he appeared before me laughing. He told me to try out this fun game, to be carried by this guy. Next memory, Dennis panicked and I was in the arms of this man. He ran away with me and the hostile lights started to seem more distant. I struggled for him to let me go because he was pressing my chest so tightly. He told me that it was fun and that I shouldn't worry. As I continued to fight and yelled for help, he then panicked and strangled me until I lost my breath. For some reason, I was able to grab his hand and pull it away from my neck. Why are you so strong? He said, and I'll never forget those words. The next memory I have is of being free, kicking him in the leg and running away. I returned and other things happened. My maths teacher caught that guy and another teacher spoke to me about something. I'm absolutely certain that they told the guy to leave. The next morning, the police arrived with this boy who was in his teens or early twenties to apologize to me because he had caused some trouble in the area the night before. I still remember his eyes widen as he saw me. My teachers called me a liar for some reason and that I shouldn't tell my parents. That's all I remember. I always believed it was a figment of my imagination. The funny thing is, I can't have anything tight around my neck. For example, ties stress me out. When I get anxiety attacks, my chest and throat tighten only. I guess it's some form of confirmation to me that those memories are true. This happened a couple of summers ago, when I was in the seventh grade. Me and a few friends were just hanging out at Long Beach in Gloucester, just playing with an aluminium bat and tennis balls. We got bored of just playing normal wiffle bat, so we decided to go do a home run derby. 
We decide to do it near the big stone wall that separates the beach houses and the beach. We said that if the ball goes over the wall, it's a home run. This works out fine for a bit, but we had to keep running up the stairs to get the ball out of people's lawns. I went up and got yelled at by some guy, so we looked for somewhere else to play. There's a large motor inn at the end of the beach that has many balconies, so we played there. Now, this is where things start to take a turn for the worst. We were hitting the ball towards the motor inn. We did this for a solid 20 minutes, until, of course, I hit the old man reading on his balcony. He yells and says he's going to get the manager. Us, being stupid, wait there, and then the manager comes and tells us that we can't play there. Here's where the beach creep comes in. This man, who's probably in his late 40s in a polo and scally cap, walks over to us and tells us that the manager is an ass. We agreed, just assuming he's trying to be nice or whatever, then he takes the bat out of my friend's hand. Luckily, I had brought my bat too, so I could hold it the whole time. Before I continue, my parents were at the complete other side of the beach, so they could not see any of this. The man then hits my friend's ass with the bat. Clearly uncomfortable, my friend says he's going to go for a walk. He didn't go to our parents because he wanted to see what was going to happen next. The man still holding the bat says that there is another good spot to hit home runs. The man then repeatedly says, I just want to hit a home run over and over, and then says, Oh, I thought we were at the other beach. How about I drive you guys there so we can play? We all say no thanks and that we want to swim. He then grabs the collar of my friend's shirt and says, You're coming with me. We were all shocked as he started dragging my friend away. That was when I realized what I had to do. I went up to the guy and said, I'll go with you. Really? He responded with a grin. That still makes me terrified to this day. And I say, yeah, then hit him with my bat as hard as I could. He goes down instantly, and my friends start crying. We run back to our parents and try to call 911, and by the time they got there, he was gone. We left right away, and now whenever I go back there, my friend always jokes about how I saved his life. I would rather not meet that guy again. I live in a small hick town which I'm not going to name for the sake of anonymity. You could call me a park ranger, but in a small town of two and a half thousand people, there isn't much to do. The park I patrolled was bigger than the damn town itself. I was doing my routine patrol around the park. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. It was mostly quiet, until I hit the trails and saw my co-worker, which was strange because we start on opposite sides of the park and meet in the middle. I called his name, but he didn't answer. I figured he just didn't hear me. So I proceeded to get closer to him while saying his name, and I still received no answer. When I got to my co-worker, I punched him on the shoulder in typical guy fashion. He was just sitting there not saying a single word. I positioned myself so I could see his face. He's staring at a tree right in front of him. Naturally, I grab my flashlight and start to look around the tree. Once I'm around the tree, I see a decent sized hole in the ground. I shine my flashlight in the hole and begin to understand why my coworker was acting so strange. There was a bear and two little Mexican boys. They had passed away. I quit later that week, as any sane person would. I never heard from my co-worker again, and word around the town says the boys weren't from around here. The newspapers said that the cause of their passing was unknown, and the bear was only wandering, and he came across some food. I personally think that someone had done something horrific. The hole they were in was freshly dug, and their bodies were fresh. I still have very vivid nightmares of my co-workers' eyes, and the lifeless bodies of those two little boys. I'm a former counsellor, and camper, 
at a camp in the northeastern United States. I would like to start off my story by stating that these things are not only my accounts of things, but other campers and counsellors. So I'll begin with some history. The camp started in the 30s, but the land is much older, back to pre-colonization, aka Indian land, from what I've heard. There was at least two battles fought on the land, one with Indian wars and the other Indian versus colonists. Now, we'll go into some stuff I have personally experienced, and I can say that my word is true, but you can't always trust the people on the internet. Anyway, the first few experiences are minor, the occasional shadow on overnights, but as I've been there longer, I've noticed more. The main thing that me and the other counsellors and even campers have mentioned is drumming late at night. Probably the scariest thing to happen to me is the other counsellors and campers went to make a final bathroom stop and get their teeth brushed. I got elected to stay back and make sure no coyotes or raccoons were trying to take the few uneaten hot dogs sitting out. I was alone. I was casually sitting on the bench when I heard what I can only describe as a rushing presence, like something was rushing around me. And I heard leaves crinkling in patterns that no animal could make. Some of the other counsellors have had stuff happen in the log cabin or mess hall. One of the campers cut himself and a counsellor, Jack, was giving first aid and was casually making conversation to stop him worrying about the blood. And he just mentions a man in a plaid shirt in the back of the room. Jack sees this and tells him there's nobody there. And the camper replies, yeah, I know you can't see him. He doesn't want you to see him. Jack quit later that week. One of the older staff has a logbook of things people have seen. And sadly, he quit and took the book before I could read it. But a picture left at his station had the camp's fire circle with a red orb above it. But almost everyone who has worked there has had one experience or another. I can confirm it is indeed Indian land because people, including me, have found arrowheads on the ground. But other than that, it's just mainly rumours that circulated, like a hunter haunting one of the cabins with his dog. And apparently, someone in the 30s got into the lake on a foggy night and drowned. Not sure if that one's true though. Either way, it is a very creepy place. I live in a rural area, about 30 minutes west of Palm Springs in Southern California. My cousin and I decided to go hike in some hills that are about 20 minutes north of an area called Oak Glen. There was no trail to get back into the hills. We actually had to trespass on a fire camp and follow a stream up towards the hills. We start climbing the hills and reach the peak of a particularly steep hill. I realize we are way away from where I parked the car, and I don't even know where the road is. On top of all that, there is a heavy fog rolling in, and we only have about 35 minutes of light left. We attempt to take a shortcut down the hill by sliding our butts down a steep slope, and to our dismay, we end up on the side of a 30 foot rock wall. Long story short, we managed to scale down the rock wall, but not before a football sized rock falls on my cousin's head. And he starts bleeding pretty badly and is heavily disoriented. We walk in the direction we think the car is in. The fog is heavy all around us now, and we're not sure if we're going the right way. My cousin is bleeding from his head when all of a sudden we come across a long 40 foot building with thick concrete walls set mostly below ground level, like a bunker in the middle of a forest. 
the windows had bars on them, and the door was heavy steel. My cousin wanted to check it out. But I was getting a total bad vibe from it. He was saying something was drawing him to it. I don't really believe in the supernatural. But I wouldn't let him go in. Just a super eerie feeling. Shortly after we passed the house, the fog led up a bit. And we luckily stumbled onto a foot trail. Weird note. We went back a few weeks later during full daylight and looked for the place but seriously couldn't find it again. We hiked around there for hours. My wallet also fell out my back pocket when we were sliding down the hill, back when we were far from any trails. My ID showed up in the mail a week later in an envelope with no note or sending address. At the elementary school I went to, there was a tradition for fifth and sixth graders to take a long day trip to Baltimore and Pittsburgh. I can't for the life of me remember which grade went into which place, but that's unimportant. The trip would start around four in the morning, and we would typically get home around one or two the following morning. This encounter happened on the way home from one of these trips. We were maybe an hour and a half away from the school. We would be dropped off to our parents and guardians. Anyway, earlier in the night, we'd made a pit stop at a restaurant for dinner. There was a guy that had been eating at the same time as us. I didn't see him myself, but apparently he'd been watching the students very intently for the entire time. From what I was told, he was probably middle-aged or a little younger, and generally he didn't look like a creep but his behavior proved otherwise. When the group finished eating and started to load back onto the bus, this man finished up his meal and packed up as well. From there, he followed us out of the restaurant parking lot. And for about the next hour down the stretch of highway, he basically played chicken with our bus. He would swerve in and out of the lanes ahead of us at turns slow down, speed up, and was generally being very creepy and dangerous. Like I said, this happened for about an hour of him basically circling the bus and making it very difficult and nerve wracking. I don't know why it took so long, but eventually one of the teachers decided to call the police and report him. At this point, we were on a stretch of highway that was familiar, and we were very close to home. Almost as if the man knew one of the teachers had called the cops, he sped up ahead of us and pulled off the highway to a small building. As we pass by, we watch him get out of his car and head towards the building entrance, all the while staring intently at our passing bus. The place he pulled off at was an adult world. I guess he'd had enough of playing chicken and wanted to choke it instead. So about one to one and a half years ago, I went on a school trip to New York. We tried to minimize every cost, so we stayed in hostels, but they were pretty nice to be fair. One day we came back and were huddled around the courtyard kind of section in front to get a debrief for the following day. There were us 30 kids and three teachers. The lead teacher was stood on the bench as she addressed us. This tall, skinny man was walking past and joined the back of our group. A few of the boys noticed and pointed it out. We had gotten a few questions from people on the trip about who we were, so we didn't find it that weird at first. The man that saw the teacher staring blurted out, You're so beautiful. She was flattered, but a little confused. He remained there as if he had joined us. It was super weird and he kept complimenting her. As we filed into the lobby, he followed. One teacher flagged one of the staff, and he kindly stepped in. Sir, which room are you in? Uh, three. Which floor, which section? I lost my key. He runs past him and continues to follow our group as we were heading down to the basement to use the kitchen. So it was definitely not a coincidence. He ended up 
getting politely escorted away. I kept coming back. Our teacher told us to go into our rooms, and I don't know what happened after, but his persistence was very creepy. This happened to my father. He joined the Navy somewhere around 80 to 84. He's told me many stories over the years, but one that sticks out in my mind was his first time at sea on a submarine. He'd recently got promoted and opted to become a submariner because of the exclusivity of the position. Less crew and usually only room for one to two people of your specific trade. Basically, you have to be the best to get on a sub. Anyway, his first night out at sea on a submarine, and everyone is asleep in their bunks. If you haven't seen them, they usually stack two to three high and line the sides of the hull in a long hallway type formation. Dad got stuck in one of the bunks at the very back. He wakes up around 2 a.m. to alarms and lights going off everyone rushing out of their bunks and out to the hatch into the next section of the submarine. Dad being the last to wake up and the last out the bunks, ended up to the latch too late. It closed, sealed, and locked in front of him, with someone shouting on the other side, Mike, find the leak. Apparently, a leak had sprung somewhere around the bunks. It either had to be fixed or that section of the submarine would have to be sealed to prevent the water from spreading, leading him to drowning. Eventually, he found it, sealed it, and the hatch was opened. He has a ton of stories, but this one is the one that scared him the most. This story also made me think of the Simpsons episode, where this happened to Homer, except he sealed it with an earring. I once escorted a church group, young kids through to adults, on a weekend overnight outing to a camp in the Poconos. The camp was set at the confluence of two streams and was somewhat rugged. The group had lots to do, a climbing wall, boating, hiking, sports, all kinds of stuff, including a nature center and a little museum. The nature center had interactive displays, fish tanks, small animals and a touch table, a large wooden table with sides on, which was scattered with all sorts of artifacts that the guests could pick up and handle. These items included deer antlers, bones, turtle shells, feathers, arrowheads, and pottery, rocks, seeds and nuts, tanned hides, etc. Little kids especially loved it. All the items were found by guests or staff while out in camp and returned to the nature center. I handled the items also, and I noticed one bone that had a really odd shape. I'm an environmental scientist by profession and an outdoorsman and naturalist for fun, and can generally recognize what bones come from what part of what animal. This bone was a human mandible, the lower jawbone of a person. It was severely worn, smooth and had no teeth, but easily recognizable as such. It had been there for years, handled by thousands of people, and no one noticed or at least reported it. I reported it to the director who removed it and notified the state police. They investigated and it seemed very old, and no one was reported missing in the immediate area, so the camp wasn't allowed to keep it. Possible explanation? The facility was the site of a timbering and ice harvesting camp up until the 1920s, and may have been the remains of a worker who perished and was buried right there. But who knows the real story? As far as I know, it's still on the table. I went on a school trip to Greece my senior year of high school, along with about seven other students and two of my teachers. I was the only senior, and there were a couple of juniors, and the rest were underclassmen, and the teachers were both in the early 30s. As I went to a very liberal slash small private school, we didn't really have much of a game plan. We just decided to play it by ear, explore the culture, see the sights and eat food. 
We stayed five nights in Athens before taking a weekend trip to Delphi. And on the fourth night, we walked to a small restaurant about 20 minutes away from our hotel. After dinner, it was pretty late. In many European countries, it's normal to eat late and spend a lot of time eating. So it may have been around 10.30 to 11 by the time we were there. And there was still a decent amount of people out as we walked through the central square of the area. I stopped to pick a song on my iPod and fell a little behind our group and noticed a guy running across the square and stopping just short of the last guy there and continued to follow him at about a two foot distance. I subtly told one of the teachers that I thought we may be being followed and he glanced around and noticed the guy and told us to walk faster. This guy sped up as well. And before we knew it, we were at a full sprint, racing across streets and in front of cars, being chased by a man we didn't know. We ran for about five minutes before getting back to the hotel, and the man followed us inside the lobby before being ambushed by the manager, who quickly took him inside and had a conversation with him in Greek. We were told the man was a Romanian and spoke poor Greek and no English and that he had been vague on his reasoning for chasing us. In my opinion, it was the hotel manager who was vague. I was more terrified and less assured after speaking to him, and we left for Delphi the next day. This happened when I was still in preschool. When I was little, I went to this Baptist church run preschool. I seriously hated going there because I'm pretty sure the principal hated my guts. But that's another story. They were pretty close to a very nice park, so they would take us there on field trips every once in a while. When we were on these trips, we were not allowed to leave the fenced in playground at the park, because it'd be too much work to actually watch us instead of letting us run wild. The park was composed of about three playgrounds, but only one of them had fencing. Since it was a public park, we couldn't be the only people in the fenced in area. Most of the time it was homeschool kids, other preschools and the occasional family taking their kid to the park while we were on our break. Every now and then, there'd be an after school program or a man reading the newspaper or a confused guy who'd mistaken the fenced in area for a dog park. Then, there was the ferret guy. I'm not very sure how ferret guy got on the playground or why he wanted to be on the playground. All I know is that he had a live ferret and that he was keeping it in his jacket and he looked pretty rough. Now, since we were bored kids and ferret guy had pretty adorable small animals hidden in his jacket, we all sort of swarmed to him to get a good look at the adorable creature. Now here's where it gets weird. We started asking why ferret guy was carrying his pet ferret around with him, to which he replied that he and the ferret actually worked at the playground. Apparently, what the job involved was sending the ferret down slides to look for loose bolts and investigating the playground equipment for electrical wires. This struck me as a little weird, but I didn't really get to ask questions about it because after an hour of ignoring us, the daycare workers suddenly noticed that all the kids were talking to a crazy homeless guy with a ferret. He gave them pretty much the same story, which led them to basically saying, okay, let's just let creepy ferret guy get back to work. Not entirely sure what happened to ferret hobo, but I'm pretty sure he was off his meds, but he was gone by the time we left. Who knows if that situation would have gone south and what would have happened if they hadn't have noticed sooner. I used to work at a Boy Scout summer camp. Every week, I had to take a big group of campers to a secluded spot for their wilderness survival badge, where they had to build a shelter out of sticks and leaves and sleep in it overnight. 
The spot in question was only about a half mile from the main camp, but we took them a circuitous route that made it seem really secluded. Anyway, on this one night in 2004, all the campers had made their shelters. We had cooked dinner and were all just sitting around the campfire. It was getting late, maybe 11 or so. So I sent all the campers to their shelters for the night and started cleaning up the fire. That's when we heard in the distance what sounded like church bells. They were pretty faint, but myself and my fellow staffers could definitely hear them. They went on for about 30 minutes, ringing every 30 seconds or so. We were a little creeped out, as there were no churches or towns within 20 miles of us. After the bell stopped though, the singing started. It was too faint to hear the words, but it sounded like a church music choir, but a lot of people and a lot more enthusiastic. Also, it was almost midnight at this point. The singing went on for well over an hour, sometimes quieting down until we almost couldn't hear it. Sometimes getting so loud, we thought it was getting closer. All of the campers were super creeped out, but I lied to them, telling them there was a church service going on in camp and that there was nothing to be scared of. Eventually, at almost 1am, the singing stopped. I found out a few days later that there had been a large KKK rally only a few miles away that night. And that is what we heard. I was a Girl Scout for many years. During the summer camp, the counsellors would often do this thing called the 12 hours where they'd basically send you alone into the woods with a pack of supplies, some tarps and a rope, and you'd have to make your own shelter and fire and stay overnight in the woods. This was an activity only reserved for the older scouts, of course. So upon being given a spot to set up camp, I made a makeshift shelter in between two pine trees. It looked pretty snazzy and everything went well. Then I tried to fall asleep in my shelter, my head resting near the pine trees. I was woken up in the middle of the night to the feeling of something crawling on my face. I woke up with a jolt as a daddy long legged spider crawled off me into the pine trees. I have no idea why I did this, but young 12 year old me thought, I'm going to see where that thing's going. I shined my flashlight at the tree and that night, I learned something very significant. Daddy long legs live in pine trees. The tree my head was resting on was covered in hundreds upon hundreds of them. All of those spiders. The two trees I used to build my shelter were practically a mating ground. I refused to build my shelter near pine trees after that. I work in a very remote part of the Appalachians. We once had a few calls in of someone leaving a tent abandoned. Now this isn't uncommon. Sometimes people will go sleep at a friend's camp for one night and come back. So we didn't fret about it too much. But after about four days and us forgetting about that original tent, someone else reported it, but this time reported a very foul smell emanating from it. It was July, it was very hot, and we started to make educated guesses. Over the course of the next few hours, we prepared ourselves for the worst, and we managed to smell the tent before we even saw it. I made my friend undo the zip, and when he opened it, a smell so foul hit my nostrils, I nearly passed out. That's what heat will do, I suppose. Turns out someone had passed away in there and they'd passed away in style as they defecated all over the tent as well. The smell was otherworldly. We passed it over to the authorities and didn't get any follow up, but I do feel sorry for that person. And it makes me wonder how they passed and why must have been sad to go in the middle of the woods. 
By the looks of it, they weren't old either. Must have been about mid thirties. Either way, quite sad and made me rethink my choice of profession as I didn't want to find any more of those ever again. This story happened on my eighth grade school trip to Philadelphia. We were there for a tour of history, and we were all staying in a Hilton. I believe it was in downtown. On one of the days after getting back from the Liberty Bell, we went to a 7-Eleven nearby to have lunch. All 10 of us were crammed into this store, but the way the shelves were laid out made it so that it was indeed possible to get separated. I was at the counter getting a slice of pizza, when a guy who looks to be in his early 30s walks into the store. He sort of stands around while the counter guy is grabbing the pizza and waits. After the clerk gives me the pizza, the man who just came and approaches me. He asks me for a favor, waves a $20 bill in my face and tells me to come outside to meet him for said favor. Keep in mind I'm only 12 at the time. I stand there frozen to the ground, not knowing what the hell to say to this guy. Luckily, my teacher, who was six and a half feet tall, walks over to us and tells the guy that he's my teacher, and if the guy needs anything, he should ask him. I guess the guy was intimidated enough that he said, oh, okay, and walks out the store. While I wasn't intending to go outside with the guy, who knows what could have happened if I did. I don't want to go to Philly again until I'm an adult now. My husband and I were hiking in Jasper Park, Canada. We were talking and passing other hikers every 15 or 20 minutes or so. We got to a part of the trail that reaches the peak and then slowly starts to move down to the other side of the foothill. And the trail is on the side of a slope. We hadn't seen anyone for maybe half hour, and all of a sudden the entire earth starts to shake, and there was a thunderous noise. We both squat down together and looked frantically around, trying to find the source of the noise, but we saw nothing, and heard nothing like branches breaking. And I thought for sure it was an elk or something, but there wasn't an animal. It would have been on the trailhead ahead of us or behind us. We started to make loud noises, and I began cracking rocks together. We kept doing this until we saw another couple of hikers about 15 minutes later. We asked if they heard or felt anything and they said no. So we warned them that there may be an animal on a trailhead. It would have been nice to know what it was. This happened about a year ago. At the end of my first year at uni, they arranged a trip to this beach slash cliff place as a drawing day as I study fine art. Me and my friend walked over to the cliff to go through these castle garden things, and we ended up on the beach on the other side of the cliff. We passed some of the tutors, so we knew we weren't too far away from where we had to meet on the bus. We decided to walk around the edge of this cliff to get to the beach, we needed to meet the bus. We basically were climbing these giant rocks. When we got halfway, we realized we had to start making a move as the tide was coming in and we would be stranded. Some guy whose voice sounded exactly like our tutor said, Hey girls, what's the time? We look up expecting our tutor to be stood there and there was this naked man stood on the cliff edge fully naked, hands on hips. We looked at each other wide-eyed, completely confused and baffled as to what to say. He asks us the time again, so I told him. He stood there and watched us and climbed away. When we made it back to the beach, just in time, as the tide had just met our feet as we climbed down, we told our tutor about the naked man. A bunch of the other people there had also seen him. It was very unpleasant. Let me set the scene. 
a small shop in Paris, and I am on a school trip to France with other pupils. Now I have always been on the tall side, so I may have looked older than I was, but at the time I was 12, but I looked at most 14. We were looking around and see this 30 to 40 year old shopkeeper staring at me. Not so much staring, but leering. Then he starts saying to me, Bisou, bisou. Now I didn't know much French, and none of the people I were with knew what it meant. Everyone felt uncomfortable, so we left. We later asked our French teacher what it meant, and we found out the creepy guy had been asking for a kiss. What a creep. I was 12 years old. I was doing some field work for my master thesis on the local river habitat. I have trail cameras to catch wildlife. On my way to find one of my cameras, I heard leaves rustling from the top of the tree, and then a dead deer fell from the tree on the ground. I made some noise and walked away. I thought it was either a bobcat or mountain lion, and I didn't want to investigate in case the animal was still there. As far as I know, bobcats don't climb on trees to carry their prey, and this was a white tail that looked pretty heavy. I went there a few hours later and the carcass was gone. As far as mountain lions are concerned, we only have rumors of one around our parts, and although I saw tracks, they were not near the cameras. I was hiking in the Carpathian Mountains, and got a chance to speak with the local mountain rangers. A lone hiker had passed the ranger's cabin wearing sneakers and footwear, and without gloves. It being winter, the ranger had told the guy that he's not properly equipped, and should probably turn back, but without effect. Once it had been dark for a few hours, and there was no signs of the hiker returning, they headed out for the rescue. The guy was lucky to be found alive. He was lying bleeding in a pit in the snow with stains all over himself and the surroundings. It turned out he had read that cutting your hands will keep you warm and prevent your fingers from getting frostbitten. Maybe the guy got his mounted survival tips from the same sources anti-vaxxers get their medical advice. I'm used to going on long drives by myself. And whenever I'm down, I take my bike and ride far away from the city to the outskirts. But if it's dark, I feel safer to take the car. One night I was driving in a very secluded area with lots of trees and bushes. There were no lights or anything, and the road was very narrow. This wasn't the highway or anything, just a road leading to a secluded outskirt of forest. As I continued driving slowly, I noticed three men approach me from the opposite direction on a single bike. When I got closer, they stopped and tried to block the road. Initially, they were signaling me to stop the car, but later one of the guys stood in the middle of the road. I noticed he had some sort of stick or weapon. I pressed the accelerator as hard as I could and drove on the bushes and escaped from them. I don't know what they were doing in the middle of nowhere and why they carried weapons. I still wonder what would have happened if I'd have stopped my car. Turns out there had been a murder in the area, and a body was buried, and a case is being investigated. I'm not entirely sure if that's connected to mine. I used to do wilderness forestry in the Linville, Georgia area of North Carolina. A jack-o'-lantern is a disembodied light that floats in the air. They're commonly reported in the Southern Appalachians, but reports are usually disregarded because it's easy to imagine that the person seeing them was seeing something more mundane. I have seen a few things that I suspected were jack-o'-lanterns, but there was one that was plain and clearly just a free floating light out in the open on the east side of Shortoff Mountain, where there are no trails in place that can be accessed by someone with good mountaineering skills and woodcraft. 
Furthermore, it was floating above brush, way too thick for anything to move quickly and smoothly through. If it was walking on the ground. I should point out, there is a confirmed similar phenomenon nearby, the brown mountain lights that has puzzled people for centuries. On hot summer nights, you can sit at wise man's view or pull off on highway east of the gorge and see jack-o'-lanterns dance along brown mountain ridge yourself. I was a summer camp counselor for the country park department when I was in high school. One late afternoon, I was walking down a trail when I heard a sound of something falling from high up in a tree. Assuming it was a branch, I glanced up, hoping to avoid getting hit. However, I was a bit shocked when about three feet away from me landed the most pissed off raccoon I'd ever seen. He bombed into the underbrush, popped up on all fours and hissed at me like it was my fault he was clumsy. We sort of regarded each other for a moment before for some reason I said out loud, I'm just going to keep going this way and walked on. No rabies for me, thanks. 